morning, folks. Uh, we're going to start the meeting. I'm going to call the Mission Fulfillment Committee to order. Regent Swigum, I'm already one minute behind. Um, I'll start with a quick note that um, we, because it's finals week and a lot of the students are in finals throughout today's meetings as well as tomorrow, uh, we will unfortunately miss uh, some voices from uh, the student representatives, but we are uh, fortunate to have one here with us this morning in this committee. So uh, if we're light on the uh, tables throughout the meetings, that's why. But thank you for being here. We know you're busy um, and school comes first. So um, with that said, we're going to start with our first uh, item, student health and wellness programs. We've got a nice uh, amount of time scheduled for presentation and discussion, and I'll turn to the provost for any opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Chair Marty. On each campus of the University of Minnesota system, we recognize the importance of st for student academic success of student mental health and wellness. Uh, to discuss the ways in which we operationalize that recognition, we've asked Gary Christensen, Chief Medical Officer in Boynton Health on the Twin Cities campus, to provide an overview of our health and well-being efforts across the system. We then want to elaborate specifically on the topic of student mental health, and we've asked Sandra olson Loy, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs on the Morris campus, to lead off that discussion. As you undoubtedly know, student mental health is a topic of urgent concern at higher education institutions across the country, and the University of Minnesota is no exception. You should also know that we have mental health counseling and service experts on each of our campuses. On the Twin Cities campus, I charge an ongoing provost council on student mental health, and there are similar efforts on the other campuses. Vice Chancellor Olson Loy convenes relevant staff across the system to discuss mental health work. Two years ago, the Faculty Consultative Committee and I charged a faculty task force with determining ways in which faculty could be responsive to the issue of student mental health. And over the past two years, we've continued to increase resources directed towards support of student mental health. Th those are just a few examples. Gary and Sandy, who are deeply engaged in this work, will offer more detail. And then at the end of their presentations, they'll be joined by Lisa Irwin, Vice Chancellor for Student Life at Duluth, Julie Thornton, Director of Student Engagement at Rochester, Barbara Kynath, Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs at Crookston, and Maggie Towell, Interim Vice Provost for Student Affairs and Dean of Students at the Twin Cities campus. Please, who would like to start? Thank you, Provost Hanson. Good morning, Regent Omari, members of the board, and our student representative. We're glad to be with you today. We're really happy to talk with you about student mental health and health and wellness high priorities across the University of Minnesota and on each of our campuses. And Gary and I, I think, have flipped our presentation order from what you had heard, Provost Hanson, so if you'll indulge us in that change of, of order and sequence. Um, we have some slides and information ready for you to share um, on our report and a great extensive amount of information that was in your docket. We do intend to move fairly quickly through the slides and to make sure that we have plenty of time for discussion with you all this morning. The American College Health Association identifies these five characteristics for successful campus health initiatives. And this morning, our presentation will highlight for you the strong network of people working across the system and on each of our campuses to foster student health and well-being. We'll share a few of our high priority student health needs at the University of Minnesota, as well as our plans, strategies, action steps to address them, and some of our interventions and our measures of progress. You'll see some campus-specific approaches reflecting the needs of our varied student populations, our missions and our locations, as well as a number of shared priorities and collaborations. Our campuses understand the need to address student health from an ecological perspective. This models, model places the need for personal change and choice within a broader context and looks at how our relationships, our community resources, policy and practice, and societal norms impact personal health. For example, we know it's easier for our students today to make the healthy choice to refrain from smoking when they're on our campuses, which are smoke-free, in a state that has a long-standing Minnesota indoor, Clean Indoor Air Act that's been recently expanded. And our goal really is to make the healthy choice the easy choice for our students. As you can see in this slide, each campus has an array of programs addressing the core dimensions of student health. 
Informed strategic planning requires good data, and we're really fortunate at the University of Minnesota that the Twin Cities Campus Boynton Health Service is a national leader in college student health assessment. For the last 20 years, they've gathered comprehensive student health data for each of our campuses and for universities across the state of Minnesota. So our work is informed by well-crafted population-based studies that look at and offer a comprehensive look at the health conditions and health-related behaviors that impact our campuses and the more than 67,000 students attending the University of Minnesota. This data, as it notes on the slide, informs our priorities and our focus, our policy development, our resource allocations, and our assessment. Today we're rooting our presentation in our most recent student health survey, the 2015 survey in the spring for three of our campuses and our 2016 survey for two of the campuses. We typically survey students at the University of Minnesota every three years and our 2018 survey just was completed um, a few weeks ago for each of our campuses. So we'll have new data to share with you in the fall. Um, you'll not be surprised that mental health continues to be the number one public health issue on all of the University of Minnesota's campuses and will be the primary focus, um, as the provost noted, for the second half of today's presentation. We think about student health care and student health at a macro level and track student access to health insurance as one of the gateways to good health care and a resource for good health. As you can see, we're in a really positive place with great improvement in the bars on the left since 2007 and our related policies and programs are listed as well as the national context that impacts this area. All of our students have access to the University of Minnesota Student Health Benefit Plan administered through UMTC's Boynton Health, which we think plays an important role in seeing that all of our students have good access to health insurance. We know that access to healthcare improves health and supports student success. Each of our campuses provides on-campus medical clinics and mental health centers that are affordable and accessible to our students as they live their daily lives with us. We prioritize work on health issues that pose significant risk. Smoking remains the leading cause of preventable death in the United States and our undergraduate student populations are at a critical age because the data shows that if you haven't started smoking by the age of 22, you're really not likely to do it. This shows our daily tobacco use rate for students at the University of Minnesota overall is at 2.5%. We also prioritize work on the health and personal issues faced by large segments of our student population. And the slide is rather dense, but you can see in the left column, stress is a high issue impacting 71% of students, followed by excessive computer internet use and sleep difficulties, as well as the other things which are significant. And we prioritize support in the areas that cause the greatest impact when students experience them on their academic success. So on the right <laughs> column, you see whether if you experience stress, a high number of those students say that it has impacted their academics in terms of their ability to manage it or to not manage their stress. Similarly, sleep difficulties, mental health issues, having a disability or experiencing homelessness, if you have those things going on in your life, you're likely to see an impact in your academics. One of the ways that we help students manage their stress on campus is by petting it away. Animal-assisted interactions feature registered therapy, animal teams, usually dogs, but also the occasional bunny and chicken and more. Uh, the sessions are free and they're offered to some degree on each of our campuses. You also see an example on the right of UMD's work with their Student Health Advisory Committee, Health Service, and the Kirby Student Center, tackling student sleep difficulties in a new pilot project. They've gathered some additional data and launched projects that identify students' issues with their sleep habits as well as the impact it has on their academic performance and health. As a result of one of their needs assessments on student sleep habits and barriers, they've created nap zones in the Kirby, Kirby Student Center, and they also are providing for students two free sleep apps where they can track and improve their sleep. We also prioritize the reduction of high risk activities that impact college students at the university and nationally. For some young adults, college life can include an introduction to or an increase in the use of alcohol, marijuana, and other drugs. As you see, again, on the left, the high-risk drinking rate among University of Minnesota students overall is 30.9%, which is down significantly from 2007, when we had a high of 40% of students impacted by high-risk drinking. 
It's difficult to draw conclusions for the reasons for campus by campus differences in rates in this or some of the other slides that you'll see today. Um, we know that the composition of our enrolled student populations can make a difference on all of this data. Um, the data includes undergraduates but also graduate students on the campuses that have them. We know high risk drinking is highest when you're between the ages of 21 to 25. Um, the University of Minnesota Duluth also has a higher male student population and men tend to engage more in high risk drinking in college than female students do. Um, we also know Minnesota overall has some of the highest high risk drinking among adults of any of the states in the country and some regions of Minnesota have higher um, rates than other parts of the state. Marijuana is the illicit drug of choice for students and the current rate Current use of any marijuana within the last 30 days is 17% um, across the university system, which is the highest to date in our surveys. UMD Health Education has coupled these results from the Boynton surveys with their own additional surveys and data from police citations to develop a new curriculum that they're adding to their freshman seminar course. They're also a partner in the T3C, a collaborative effort that's aimed at reducing dangerous drug and alcohol use among college students across the city of Duluth. On the Twin Cities campus, you see before you the list of all of the many partners that are a part of the Alcohol Policy and Abuse Prevention Committee, a longtime entity in the Twin Cities that focuses on campus environmental strategies that have been shown to be effective at reducing high risk drinking and also its negative impacts. Among students on all of our campuses, 10.3% reported in spring 2015 or spring 2016 when they completed the last survey that they had experienced actual or attempted sexual assault within the previous 12 months. As you know, the President's Initiative to Prevent Sexual Misconduct, which is a comprehensive public health strategy, was initiated this fall system-wide and is in its early phases of implementation to further strengthen our work around reducing sexual violence and responding to it effectively. While well, our University of Minnesota Rochester campus had the highest sexual violence incident rates reported among those surveyed, they also had lower levels of students reporting their experiences and seeking help. The campus Title IX lead team is actively working to raise awareness, to build trust, and to add support so that students, faculty, and staff in Rochester feel more comfortable reporting. Turning to physical health, for two-fifths, 40% of our students, their body mass index calculated by their self-reported weight and height on the surveys places them in the overweight or obese, extremely obese categories with all of the associated health risks that come with being overweight or obese. We do have some good news related to um, weight and health. Over half of our students and nearly two-thirds of the students at Duluth report levels of physical activity that actually meet the Center for Disease Control's recommendations for the high classification for moderate or vigorous physical activity. And as the slide notes, we note that physical activity is positively correlated not just with physical health, but also with mental health and with cognitive function. And each of our campuses prioritizes providing facilities and programs that boost this positive student health behavior. On the Twin Cities campus, an impressive 1.3 million visits to the University Recreation and Wellness Facilities, or RecWell, and the other numbers that you see reflect the really high level of student engagement that we see in these programs and resources. We're also thinking about food access, as more than one in five University of Minnesota students report worrying about whether their food would run out before they had money to buy more. The issue of food insecurity is a new survey question and a new survey finding for us and new work for our campuses as it is across many of the universities in the U.S. Data shows that young adults generally eat fewer fruits and vegetables than recommended, another factor in our overweight and obesity rates. At Morris, the Morris Healthy Eating Project is working to make fresh vegetables, fruits, and other healthy foods more affordable and accessible on our campus within the city of Morris and also within Stevens County. As you can see in this lovely photo, Morris students are happy to be growing their own fruits and vegetables on campus. <coughs> This next slide captures the University of Minnesota Crookston's new wellness center, which has added tremendous cardio, strength, group fitness, and intramural resources for Crookston students over the past two years. Here are just a few of the collaborations that are underway across our system supporting student health, and Dr. Christensen will talk with you more about the system-wide mental health collaboration. 
In closing for my section of the presentation, uh, we note that our students and their voices are really at the heart of each of these programs, and we appreciate one of our fourth year University of Minnesota students, Julia Woodward from our Rochester campus, bringing our data and programs to life for us today. Julia has provided what she's entitled, My Health and Wellness Journey, for us to share with you. She says, when I first arrived at the University of Minnesota Rochester, I was excited for the experience and the health science focused classes. I had the mindset that I would succeed with ease as I had in high school. I had a rude awakening my first semester. I was struggling significantly in my one of my classes. I figured that studying more would fix everything, but progressively things worsened. In fact, every time I went to take an exam, I would be overcome with panic, and the time allotted for exams was never quite enough. I repeatedly left large portions of tests blank, and as a result, I was afraid for every upcoming exam. I failed the class. My confidence and drive tanked. I didn't know what I was doing wrong or what to, make, what to do to make things better. Before I knew it, second semester was ending, and I was failing my second University of Minnesota Rochester class. I was on academic probation, and I was now required to meet with my student success coach, Steph. At the time, I considered this meeting a sign of failure that was greater than the failing grade itself. I wasn't looking forward to meeting with her. Looking back now as a senior, I can say that these meetings with my student success coach were the best possible thing for me. Steph explained to me that the emotions and reactions I was experiencing didn't seem like just nerves, and that it was possibly anxiety. After reflecting and really thinking about it, I met with a doctor and was diagnosed with anxiety. I then met with Chris, the health and wellness advocate at UMR, who at the time was also our disability coordinator. I was able to set up testing accommodations for my anxiety, and I received time and a half, as well as a semi-private testing environment for each exam. After taking advantage of these accommodations and using mindfulness strategies that Chris taught me, I saw an incredible increase in my self-esteem, my life skill, and my grades. I got off academic probation. While I was no longer required to meet with my success coach, I decided to continue meeting with her as a trusted and wise resource. During my junior year, UMR got funding for a disability resource coordinator and she helped me with my testing accommodations. I'm a senior now and I choose to still meet with all of these UMR resources on a regular basis. After going through the experience I had my first year and the next, I was inspired and wanted to help other students dealing with mental health struggles at Rochester. Growing up, I had learned that talking about mental health was a bad thing, a sign of weakness. I met others at UMR who believed the same. Mental health can be good and bad, and either way, I think it's good to talk about it. When my friend came to me and talked about starting a group on campus that focused on mental health, I was all for it and joined the board. To Write Love on Her Arms, T-W-L-O-H-A, is a group raising awareness and breaking the stigma associated with mental health. Prior to the start of my senior year, as the president of this new club, I was a part of hiring Rochester's first mental health therapist. I know that he is helping many UMR students who have struggled just as I did. Without the experience I had here at UMR, I would not be the person I am today or be the president of a student organization contributing to a worthy cause. My overall mental health has improved from the interactions I've had with my success coach, my health and wellness advocate, and my disability resource coordinator. They helped me work through some very unexpected challenges that I faced my first year of college with mental health and the significant ac academic setbacks I experienced. And in the process, they've given me the necessary tools to properly approach any obstacles I may have in the future. We thank Julia for sharing her story with us and with her peers as we work to recognize and address the impact of mental health challenges within our students' lives. My colleague from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, Boynton Health, Dr. Gary Christensen, will provide system-wide information on student mental health. Thank you. The University of Minnesota has historically addressed the response to mental health demands within the individual campuses. This has allowed each of our five campuses to tailor services in ways that are responsive to their unique programs, student demographics, and geography. However, this approach can result in resource inequities over time and limit opportunities to leverage potential best common solutions across all campuses. The University of Minnesota System-Wide Mental Health Learning and Collaboration Network was established in fall 2017 to facilitate a more coordinated response to student mental health. 
The collaboration aims to use a proactive, data-informed approach that includes both preventive and interventive strategies. It provides new opportunities to leverage experience and resources to identify best practices and best common solutions while recognizing the uniqueness of each campus. The collaborative network membership is both broad and deep as demonstrated on this slide. Surveys reveal that mental health diagnoses are prevalent in University of Minnesota students. Roughly one in three students, system-wide, report a lifetime history of a mental health diagnosis. One in five report a diagnosis of an, excuse me, an, of an anxiety disorder. Similarly, one in five students report a history of a lifetime diagnosis of depression. In addition to diagnosable conditions, one in three students report that they are unable to manage stress. Surveys also reveal that the prevalence of mental health diagnoses on our campuses is increasing over time. We note that the uh, Morris and Rochester student data is a year newer than the student data from the other three campuses, uh, but as already referred to, we'll have synchronized data uh, coming. Prevalence rates vary somewhat from campus to campus. Potential reasons for these variances have been detailed in the full mental health report. Although not included on this slide, the student health survey reveals one additional important figure. Nearly 1% of University of Minnesota students have attempted suicide in the previous 12 months. Although this is a small percentage, this translates to several hundred University of Minnesota students attempting to take their lives each year. Not only is this indicative of the regular possibility of loss of student life, but this is consistent with the known efforts currently employed by campus uh, safety officials, mental health professionals, care managers, and others in interventions and appropriate aftercare. High rates of mental health diagnoses and unmanaged stress correlate with an increased demand for mental health services that has been witnessed for many years. <clears throat> it's worth noting that 42% of incoming Twin Cities freshmen report that they are likely, or very likely, to seek personal counseling, which most likely refers to some form of psychological counseling. Taken together, these observations suggest a fundamental shift in both student need and expectations for mental health resources during their education. A good measure of demand and use of mental health resources is the percent of eligible students seen in the university's counseling services and mental health clinic. These rates vary between about 7% for Duluth to around 29% for Crookston. Data for the Twin Cities campus is reported separately for the two mental health services on campus, the mental health clinic at Boynton Health and the student counseling services. These two services differ in theoretical emphasis, funding models, mission, and other aspects that factor into staffing levels and service capacity. It should be noted that service delivery numbers have the potential to underestimate demand as they can be restricted by the number of service providers available and the corresponding maximum capacity of our counseling services and clinics. Demand for mental health counseling and clinical resources can easily exceed available resources particularly when resources are fixed, but demand varies across the year. Requests for intakes need to be balanced with opportunities for follow-up opportunities. When these two needs conflict, the solution on many campuses is to place students on a wait list. The university experienced large wait lists in fiscal year 15 and fiscal year 16 at both Twin Cities Mental Health Services. Increased space and staff and new intake procedures have successfully eliminated wait lists for the last two years, with the exception of a wait list for ongoing counseling in the uh, counseling service during periods of high demand. Counseling and therapist staff to student ratios vary from around 1 in 750 students at Rochester to 1 in 2800 at Duluth, although Duluth's ratio will be about 1 in 1100 when a new counselor arrives in August. An often quoted recommended ratio for college counselors is 1 to 1,000 to 1 in 1,500 students. However, this figure has questionable basis, has not been updated to account for increased demands, and does not account for variables such as a student body size, composition, rate of mental health diagnoses, geographical location, or access to community resources. In addition to counseling and talk therapy, medications can be helpful in treating mental health diagnoses and mitigating their impacts. Although mild to moderate anxiety and depression can be treated by campus primary care providers who may prescribe medications, it is increasingly common for students to present with more severe depression and anxiety or other disorders, such as bipolar disorder, first episode psychosis, ADHD, eating disorders, and other conditions that are beyond the training and experience of primary care. 
Corpson, Duluth, Morris, and Rochester do not have psychiatrists on campus and are dependent on community resources which are commonly associated with long wait times, distance from campus, and significant out-of-pocket costs. Morris began a successful collaboration with the Twin Cities campus this year, offering access to one of our Boynton Hill service psychiatrists to Morris students using telepsychiatry. This new program counters a six-month wait list for Morris students in accessing off-campus services. Mental health case managers coordinate care and provide support to students across multiple dimensions, such as accessing resources, scheduling appointments, and working through times of increased stress. They are particularly useful to students who have been hospitalized for a mental health crisis and then transition back to campus following hospital discharge. Crookston and Rochester do not have anyone specifically dedicated to this function, despite a substantial need. Morris Student Affairs offers limited resources for students after hospitalization, but doesn't have a dedicated mental health case manager and sees growing demand in this area. Duluth, devoted, excuse me, Duluth devotes three quarters of a full-time position to care manager. The Office for Student Affairs at the Twin Cities campus has had a full-time care manager since 2015. The position has become a go-to resource for many on campuses with nearly 350, 350 cases receiving attention this academic year. That's a 21% increase year over year. To better meet demand, a second full-time care manager was hired in late April. The University of Minnesota Disability Resources System Campus Collaborative was established in 2014. The collaborative has witnessed a system-wide increase in the students seeking accommodations for mental health over time. This upward trend has been greatest for the small campuses where psychological disabilities account for more than half of those seeking disability accommodations. Students with mental health conditions generally require staff to spend greater time with the students and their instructors. This stretches resources further and limits staff ability to attend to broader issues of inclusive design and policy. As shown in this slide, the ratios of access consultants to students varies across the university's five campuses. Compared to smaller campuses, the larger departments of bigger campuses also benefit from the ability of staff to focus on specific disability categories such as mental health. The ability to respond to acute mental health crises is essential. Surveys reveal that two to five and a half percent of University of Minnesota students have accessed a mental health crisis line in the previous two months. All system counseling services see walk-in crises and take crisis calls during business hours. Campus police and community service staff provide 24-7 responses to mental health crises. A dedicated crisis phone line and dedicated text line are available for University of Minnesota students system-wide, although most campuses prefer to rely on crisis lines in their region. For example, Duluth has an excellent relationship with Birch Tree Center, which provides a crisis line, mobile crisis unit, and short-term residential crisis support. And Crookston uses the Northwestern Mental Health Center's 24-hour crisis services hotline and related intervention and stabilization services. All campuses are able to take advantage of their county mobile crisis teams. Our campuses employ a variety of strategies to improve access for students with mental health concerns, particularly for students who are uncomfortable seeking traditional mental health services. Let's Talk is an outreach program created by Cornell University, which was first offered to University of Minnesota students at Duluth. The program was successfully piloted this year at Morris and is being launched on the Twin Cities campus. Let's Talk provides brief, informal, unscheduled, confidential drop-in sessions with counselors at locations that are outside of the counseling service. Locations are strategically chosen to reach underserved uh, communities. Duluth, Morris, and the Twin Cities offer Let's Talk sessions two days a week. Learn to Live is an online cognitive behavioral therapy program, which also provides another means of accessing care. Learn to Live was made available system-wide to fee-paying students beginning in fiscal year 2018. Learn to Live provides mental health screening and interactive therapy modules focused on anxiety, depression, social anxiety, and sleep. To date, approximately 4,500 students have completed a screening and or enrolled in an online therapy. Initial assessments reveal high satisfaction with the program, as well as progress towards student personal goals. Learn to Live has improved access to therapy for a significant number of University of Minnesota students during its pilot year, and is expected to reach even more students next year. Targeting unmanaged stress with preventive programming is essential when addressing student mental health. The College Student Health Survey reveals an association between unmanaged stress, poor mental health, and lower GPA. Managed stress is an important life skill for all students to learn. 
at the University of Minnesota, all the University of Minnesota system campuses have invested in mental health prevention and stress reduction programming. Common system-wide approaches employ mindfulness, yoga, animal-assisted interactions, and education on stress reduction. Other approaches have been unique to specific campuses and offer opportunities for replication or modification to suit the needs of other campuses. Advocate um, examples of the latter include the University of Minnesota Twin Cities Mental Health Advocate Program, in which 50 staff and faculty have been trained and identified as go-to people within their academic departments for support and resources. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities De-Stress Program offers peer-directed stress assessments and recommended stress reduction approaches to students. The Chemistry Department Council of Graduate Students and the Professional Student Government have all collaborated with Boynton to create surveys that are useful for evaluating individual academic programs and issues related to graduate student mental health. A detailed review of current preventive programming can be found in the docket report. Efforts to address mental health are also championed by students. Multiple student groups across the university system have a primary objective of, address, of addressing student mental health, including chapters of national associations like Active Minds and To Write Love on Her Arms. In addition, unique mental health focused student groups and campus life programs have been established that provide information and anti-stigma campaigns, support groups, bystander training, resource lists, stress screening, and stress reduction events and activities. Other, and other student groups, including our student governments, have made student mental health a top priority. Faculty and instructor involvement is also crucial to a comprehensive approach to student mental health. Student issues are often first recognized in the, in the classroom, the lab, or in field work. Faculty and instructors can also affect change on the structure of educational delivery that's appropriate but can reduce stress without compromising academic rigor. All University of Minnesota campuses include faculty and instructor engagement as part of the overall strategy to address student mental health. Efforts include Crookston Counseling Center staff attendance at faculty department meetings, resource cards for faculty on how to respond to student crises at Duluth, a half-day workshop for faculty at, at Morris on strategies to support students with mental health issues, mental health first aid training at Rochester, and multiple trainings using the 4R model, the four standing for recognized role, resources, referent, and referring on the Twin Cities campus. At the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, the newly reorganized Provost Council on Student Mental Health includes a faculty and instructors committee. This reorganization was partly in response to the 2017 report of the Joint Task Force on Student Mental Health. That report also included recommendations specific to faculty and instructors in regards to their roles and proficiencies in addressing student mental health, instructional strategies, accommodations, supportive environments, and commitment by departmental leadership. Extensive strategies to accomplish task force recommendations was detailed, are detailed in the task force report. We're also sharing the Twin Cities research and, re and recommendations to further our learning, capacity building, and equitable access to mental health resources through our system-wide mental health network. All five University of Minnesota campuses have responded to the growing demand for mental health services, often through additional funding. Corkson did not request funds specifically for mental health initiatives in the past two years, but instead focused on a strategy to reallocate funds to spend towards areas of need, such as mental health. Corkson received a $10,000 gra gra uh, grant, excuse me, $10,000 grant from a generous benefactor for the purpose of increasing 8.75 counseling position to full time. Although there is hope that the gift will be renewed, there is no guarantee. Full renewable funding for the position would be a worthwhile investment. Duluth received additional funding in the last University of Minnesota budget compact process to add two additional mental health counselors in fiscal year 18. One new counselor has already joined the staff and another will start in August. Morris received support through the fiscal year 18 compact process to hire a new mental health provider to lead an initiative developing and implementing a campus-wide holistic framework to promote student mental health and well-being. Morris also received support to coordinate our new system-wide collaboration and learning network of mental health and student affair leaders. A portion of the funding is designated to share our successful models with Let's Talk, like Let's Talk across our campuses and to launch new system-wide mental health pilots such as the telemedicine pilot connecting Morris with a Boynton psychiatrist. Expanded student fee support has also allowed Morris to add part-time mental health counselors to improve access and increase provider diversity. 
Rochester received additional funding, uh, recurring funds to support the hiring of a licensed counselor who started in August of 2017. This has resulted in much more responsive services to students compared to a previous contract for services with community providers. It should be noted that current funding will fall short of associated costs for the position in fiscal year 19. Boyne Health received permanent increases in funding from student service fees in fiscal year 16, 17, and fiscal year 18, as well as additional funding for two years from the president and provost. Funding was necessary to increase staff, eliminate the wait list, and respond to the steadily increasing demand for mental health services, which is currently in the range of 20 to 25 percent each year. This slide, fig uh, fig uh, excuse me, or, excuse me. this slide features new hires since last year's report to the Board of Regents. Twin City Student Counseling Services received additional funding from the President and Provost for three years, which allowed for the hiring of four half-time intake counselors. This increased the counseling services capacity for same-day intakes and crisis counseling. Another position was redefined, which allowed the counseling service to provide focused outreach to diverse student groups and to initiate a Let's Talk program. The final two slides summarize current mental health programming system-wide using a color-coded system in which green indicates our assessment of where we offer adequate services, red a significant need, and yellow somewhere in between. We want to emphasize that this rating system in no way reflects the quality of any existing service which we believe to be generally strong. As detailed in your docket materials and summarized here, all of our five campuses effectively survey our students to determine mental health needs, provide counseling services, and respond to emergencies. We all increase access, have worked to increase access to care, employ preventive strategies, and to engage students and faculty. A primary gap in resources for the University of Minnesota system is access to psychiatry services. Crookston, Duluth, and Rochester are without their own psychi or psychiatric services. Morris was previously in the same situation and is mitigating this need through their pilot collaboration with the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, uh, Boynton Health. Challenges also exist with disability services, which are taxed system-wide by the increasing number of students, requiring psychiatric assessments and accommodations. In addition, Crookson and Morris do not have dedicated mental health case management resources, despite having the highest percentages of their student bodies using counseling services, as well as limited access to psychiatry, which, when taken together, would be predictive of a greater need for care management. The University of Minnesota's system-wide mental health learning and collaborative network uh, appreciates this opportunity to review the current status of student mental health and associated programs and resources. We are committed to strengthening the University of Minnesota's approach to student mental health. Increased dialogue and problem solving between key stakeholders across the system has already demonstrated the potential to leverage the experiences and resources of each campus to the benefit of all. The dialogue will continue in two weeks with the collaborative network convenes for our first in-person uh, meeting, which will be hosted at the University of Minnesota Duluth. So with the permission of uh, Regent Tomari, I would like to invite Lisa Irwin, Vice Chancellor for Student Life and Dean of Students from the University of Minnesota Duluth, Barbara Kynath, Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs from the University of Minnesota Crookston, Julie Thornton, Director of Student Engagement from the University of Minnesota Rochester, and Maggie Tall, Engine Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students, University of Minnesota Twin Cities, to join us for a discussion with the board. We welcome your questions and discussion on student uh, health and wellness at the University of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor Olson, Loy, and Dr. Christensen. Welcome uh, to those who just joined the table. Uh, and for members, I want us to be keeping in mind that there's a very robust report um, in the docket material, so feel free to reference that. And thank you to everyone who prepared that report. I know it's not just those at the table. Um, and keep in mind that we're talking about this ecosystem of health and well-being, and then we're getting more specific into the conversation about mental health as we have this conversation uh, moving forward. And so uh, I welcome comments, questions from uh, the board. Please, uh, Regent Anderson. I don't like going first, but it looks like he was looking for somebody. But um, I, have, I have several comments, several questions, possibly some ideas that could use some answers. Um, interesting, you know, my very first meeting on the board the student regents talked about financial literacy. And I see we've got counseling and finances. And I, I, I'm somebody who thinks that's really, really important because I think, you know, kids are spending money. They, if their bank account's short, it leads to other issues, mental health, all kinds of things. And so I just like to make sure that we 
you know, you don't have to answer this right away, but that we are giving those students financial literacy questions. I remember one of the student regents saying, you guys are teaching us really, really how to go out and make a living, but you're not teaching us how to spend our money. And I think that's important. I, I came from a family where we talked about that at the kitchen table every night and savings and the power to see a savings account grow and grow and even though they're students. So I, I'm, I'm, I want to just make sure we continue on that. Um, moving, moving to, uh, I'll just talk about one thing, one statistic that caught me was that we have coming into this school 40% of the students would be listed by body mass as overweight or obese. Um, I, and I think these are bright kids. These aren't the kids that don't understand what that does for the future. So, so my question is, in private enterprise, this, this is a thought, and I, I, I don't know. I, I just think it's, it's bad for the state as a whole. Um, I learned later in life to exercise all the time, and I feel better because I do it. Um, are, are there some projects we can work on? I, I know small businesses are working with uh, employees that may use a Fitbit with, with instead of giving advertising here that employees that get 10,000 steps a day receive a $3 discount per day on their health insurance premium. We have a state legislature that the return on investment, would, in my opinion, would be incredible if these kids don't have health problems when they're 40, 50, and, and chronic health care is what costs health care costs rise. It's not the heart surgeries and things, it's chronic health care. I would think that we should look into partnering with some of the health care companies in Minnesota or our state legislature to try to get a financial incentive. That's what people understand today. A financial incentive for people to be healthy, including our students. And in today's way to track data and metrics with a Fitbit or a phone, those things are, are possible. Um, my final point um, goes to that same type of thought process. I'm switching it to mental health. 42% um, of our kids, again, smart kids coming in here, believe they're going to seek counseling when they're here for mental health issues. So I, I guess I, I'm, I'll finish. I'm going to tell you and then I got a question. Um, in private enterprise, again, small businesses like, like I have, we can't afford mental health professionals on staff for a small business. But there are a lot of new companies coming out that have telehealth or telemental health or telepsychiatrists where you can pay a subscription service and your employees can contact that group. I guess I'm interested if we have any idea if there's a drop off in success between in person counseling and the telecounseling or Skype type counseling, which I think we could leverage at probably less cost. Uh, but if it's a drop off in doing, you know, and I'm thinking of the, 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 the student that's thinking of suicide, even. It might be at midnight, it might be at midnight. And I'm guessing some of our offices aren't open at midnight. So it's, it's an after hours. So I guess that's a long, I've, I've given you a long range of things. I don't know if anybody wants to tackle what I said, but those are things that came to my mind watching this presentation. And thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Regent Anderson. Um, the, the one piece about the, the benefits, I do know employees through their health plans have uh, a benefit for going to the gym or standing or what have you, as well as graduate students through their um, uh, health care plans. I'm not sure about undergraduates, and I'd imagine that you all probably have some thoughts on some of the things that uh, Regent Anderson raised. So who would like to, to try out first? Uh, Regent Omari, Regent Anderson, as the presenter of this chunk, let me just add a few things and open up for my colleagues. Um, I think we know that college students, 40%, as you noted, are in that obese and overweight categories. Um, within the general population, it's 60%. And so students, by and large, are still healthier than the rest of us. Um, but we recognize that most of our undergraduates are in that age where you set your kind of lifetime patterns and that those rates are still too high, as with childhood obesity rates. And so it's really a priority for us to 
to think about. I think you raised some good suggestions in terms of I have my Fitbit on currently and I'm tracking my steps and doing all of those things and the technology that does support us looking at what we're doing is significant. We do provide for undergraduates at each of our campuses access to our student health and wellness facilities at the Morris, it's the regional fitness center that's shared with our community, but with student fees, students do have access to those programs and we also have wellness um, teams that look at how to increase participation in those programs across the campus. Please, Dr. Chris. Yes, Rachel Mari, Richard Anderson. Um, I'll, I'll address some of the mental health uh, uh, comments. Oh, first of all, uh, uh, let me uh, address the kind of overall aspect of some kind of um, point system or, or that. That comes up actually as a frequent uh, uh, discussion. So it, it is something that just hasn't been quite worked out as well as as the uh, the system that we're the. the uh, program that we're able to provide to staff and faculty, um, which is uh, primarily uh, uh, benefits from the, the huge enrollment in that in that program. But I think it's a great, uh, great point. And I think it can actually, um, there may be a way of leveraging that even for mental health activities. And you know, you get points if you engage with uh, learn to live and things like that, or other preventive strategy, strategies such as the de-stress um, stress assessments and things like that. Um, because I think that actually the, there may be a lot more investment, uh, a better a return on investment for the preventive strategies actually than adding more money into interventive. Um, one thing I've always said about cognitive behavioral therapy is that you actually teach the person to be their own therapist. And that's, that's value that carries on forward. Um, uh, at the same time, though, that you do have to address, um, you know, potential issues. There's maybe some savings with uh, telepsychiatry and such, um, but usually the systems I'm familiar with, there's still a cost per encounter, uh, and then of course the, the the savings maybe are in in, in overhead a little bit, um, as far as I've been able to assess it so far. Um, the emergency services, yes, um, that has to be addressed, and I think that the we, you know the 24/7 uh, uh, line that we have now for crisis serves that purpose uh, in, to a certain degree, uh, and the text line. And interestingly enough, students are using the uh, crisis text line just as much as the crisis phone line. So it's the you know providing that new uh, method of accessibility has also proved to be an advantage. We've reached an additional number of people that we may not have reached before. Um, all great ideas, and uh, we'll bring them back into our discussions. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, almost everyone around the horseshoe, so I'll start with uh, Regent Shu. Thank you, Chairman Mari. Thank you, presenters. Um, I have uh, one question about why the why are we looking at data that seems to be pretty old? Uh, why wouldn't we do this uh, type of surveying more frequently? I mean, I, I just find it odd. We're sitting here in you know mid 2018, looking at 2015, 16 data. Um, I know not all of it is old, but it's kind of hard to um, understand if we're actually succeeding by the things we're doing on a daily basis if we don't know for a few more years uh, basically what uh, the difference is going to be. And we're, we're sampling theoretically, a, I mean, we know we're sampling a different set of students um, every three years. So anyway, that's my, that's my first question is how do we get better data? Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about is how do we make sure, I know I've mentioned this before in this topic, but how do we make sure that we're not creating um, some of the stress that's out there? And what I mean by that is what, what are we doing to make sure that, and this is keeping in mind that we're having a tenure discussion uh, later on, but what are we doing to make sure that we are um, doing a good job teaching the students and not uh, causing problems with um, classes or faculty or um, graduate students who are, you know, causing undue stress on students, uh, which obviously um, is going to cause a problem with our graduation rates and retention rates and all that kind of stuff. So, how do we how do we work that in? I mean, I know you can get a case manager, but what what does that case manager or what is that uh, therapist or whatever? What are they able to do? I didn't see an org chart today, so I don't really know how everybody's connected. But at what you know, how would somebody uh, treating um, uh, or counseling a patient or a student get 
to the root cause of the problem, which may be something happening in, in a class or residence hall or whatever. And then, you know, I do have some, you know, acknowledging that the data is old, it just looks like there's some things happening on the Duluth campus that are out of whack with uh, the rest of the rest of the campuses. And what I'm talking about are the charts on, um, you know, tobacco, substance use in general, um, high-risk drinking, uh, marijuana <coughs> use, et cetera. So um, maybe I'll just stop there. Thank you, Regent Chu. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious to hear the answers. My, my, my assumption on the first question is actually that the data is probably better that we don't do it more frequently because then we'll have survey fatigue and people actually won't respond to the survey um, rather than having them every year, which I know is uh, survey fatigue is a very big thing, but y'all know better than me, so. <clears throat> Take that first. Please. Regent Omari, Regent Shu, thank you for the question. I apologize, the, the Duluth slide on high-risk drinking is wrong. It's actually 35.1%, not 45.1%. So that's, it's still the highest in the system, but I think related to the first question, we can tell a great story about the three iterations of the survey that we've used in Duluth. In 2010, it was 44.9%. In 2015, it's 35.1%, and we think that our efforts over the years, which are numerous, um, have made a difference in that figure. So it's, out of, it's not as out of whack as perhaps you might have thought. Does the same go for marijuana use? I did not look at those data. Anyone else on any other other comments that Regent Shu had, Dr. Christensen? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, the uh, one one thing that we also know, I, I, I appreciate uh, Regent Mario your comments about uh, about fatigue, um, survey fatigue. That is one thing that we hear from students, and we know that the more we survey, and everyone wants to survey students, um, the less response rates we get, less, less reliability. But the other thing is that um, by surveying every three years or so. Um, you actually will see change. When you, uh, our, our experience, at least from my understand, from our survey group, uh, which is in the in the audience, uh, is that you usually don't see as much change from year to year. It's uh, you usually have to have a couple of years, um, you know, distance to really see change, and um, and that can then also lead to uh, misperceptions if you're just always comparing to the year before that. Well, we're not making a difference, or we've only made two percent difference or one percent difference. Um, so that's my understanding of one of those. Uh, why that issue, uh, why, why they choose to survey about every three years. And then there's a cost uh, consideration, of course, uh, as well. Regent Shu. Uh, just a quick follow-up. Uh, thank you, Regent um, Omari, Chair Omari. Um, you, you mentioned cost. Well, that was kind of one of the things I was getting to. I mean, what is the cost of uh, surveying? If it's uh, substantial, I can understand it. But if it's not, I mean, I think your questions are a little bit... Um, interesting because uh, I think looking at old data is probably worse than looking at data that may be suspect because we don't get a good response rate. But I think those are, there's other ways to deal with that. Um, and if it's, if it's a cost issue, then we should uh, obviously look at it uh, so we can determine, because we're actually spending money, we're actually putting resources on these issues um, without really knowing what, uh, whether or not the problems are really there because we're acting so late after the fact, you know, after the actually sam actual sampling. So mm -hmm. maybe you could respond to that. Um, sure. Um, interim, interim Vice President Tao. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, Salinio, <laughs> uh, Chair Omari, uh, Regent Shu. I just wanted to let you know that we have done the survey this fall, and we're currently doing the analysis right now. So we would be able to report on that if the Board of Regents wishes to hear the more data um, by fall. In terms of the cost of the survey, I don't have that answer. Else uh, yes, uh, Regent Omari, uh, Regent Shu. Um, there's so much data in there, that is not my area of expertise and costs. We do, if you'd like, we could call upon uh, one of our experts in the uh, in the audience who would be able to answer those questions, or I could get back to with that. For, for the sake of time, we'll, we'll come back to it offline. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, Regent Powell. Uh, thank you, Chair Amari, and uh, thank you. Thanks to the presenters for the presentation, and <clears throat> more importantly, all the, you know, really very comprehensive system-wide work um, that um, supports it and you know our efforts to deal with the mental health challenges of our student population so I think we're probably maybe on a few on a few themes and 
You know, one of the questions I have is so 75% um, of the population says, feel, you know, has stress, you know, is the, and so I guess one of the first question I have is do we know, you know, what are the, um, what are the major stressors that our students, and we can probably guess, you know, in grades, money, class, but I think do we know about, you know, what they are? And then the second question, and a related part to that is the, the one that's half, half um, uh, that one of the issues is excessive computer and device use, and I'm just wondering if maybe you can elaborate on what that is and, and what it means. Then a, then, a, then a sort of a point is, um, you also commented that students who are engaged at you know the right levels of, of you know fitness related activity you know, tend to manage stress better. So I think Regent Anderson already has touched on this, but mm -hmm. you know nutrition and fitness and sleep behavior seem to be such powerful preventative mm -hmm. um, activities and so are do we are we doing enough really to just make sure that we're supporting and incenting and you know those behaviors because I mean I think your point on prevention uh, we, we, we're going to have to intervene but the more we can prevent the better off we are and then the last question is the number of students who who come into our population with being you know that are being treated and hopefully successfully for depression or anxiety and this is kind of a I, I don't know, it's sort of an insurance question, but if they are coming in and they have an established relationship with a psychiatrist and they're being treated for depression, as an example, then when they become one of our students, are they ours or do they maintain? Or how, how, do, how does the whole referral to psychiatry work and, are, and is that a, a, you know, a, a something that we bear through our insurance programs? So stressors, um, prevention, mm -hmm. computers, and a little bit on insurance, maybe. Thank you, Regent Powell. And the stressor piece comes back to Regent Shu's question as well around instruction and faculty, so please. Um, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Regent Powell and Regent Shu. I should have gotten back to that, too, as well, and Regent Shomari. Um, the, uh, first, I, I'd like to uh, point out that um, we often use the word you know, stress, and 70% of students um, describe stress. Um, yet stress itself, is not necessarily a predictor of other challenges, such as poor GPA and things like that. It's the inability to manage the stress. Because stress, you know, without stress, we probably wouldn't be productive at some level. So you have to have some level of stress. Um, uh, and, you know, for, for some students, they thrive on stress. Um, but it's when you can't manage the level of stress, that's when we start seeing problems. That's when we start seeing correlations with anxiety disorders, depression disorders, poor GPA, poor physical health, all of those. Um, so, I, so that's one thing that I think uh, in, the, in the data, the most important uh, aspect is probably the percentage of students that say that they can't uh, manage stress, which is still a fair, fair number. Uh, uh, and uh, as far as the preventive strategies, yes, I think that uh, there's uh, pretty good documentation of the different ways that we're trying to introduce that. Um, and uh, particularly, uh, there's a uh, mental health uh, strategy that has been developed by our uh, pre uh, the Preventive Health Division at Boynton Health um, that uh, really looks at getting students to identify what their values are, um, what are their motivations, um, identifying different ways that they could manage stress, and then adapting them rather than having a kind of cookie cutter. You know, everyone's going to exercise. That's what you need to do because that doesn't, you know, isn't uh, necessarily what everybody wants to do for managed stress. Um, so um, I think we're investing more and more effort uh, in that aspect. Um, the computer, uh, and that you asked about what are the stresses, um, uh, I mean, there's multiple ones, uh, but uh, I think that uh, part of it is um, information overload, um, news overload, um, the, uh, the sense of um, multiple negative things bombarding you all the time because of cell phones and things like that. The way we, the way individuals interact uh, as well uh, has changed and such. And I'm not saying that that's uh, uh, wrong necessarily either, because um, you know my generation just may not be able to appreciate a generation that is, you know, raised on on technology. Uh, but uh, I think we do see the effects of that. I mean, relationships are different, things like that. You did ask about the uh, kinds of stresses, and we do in our report um, do ask about the stresses. Relationships are a big part of it, um, relationships with roommates, relationships with parents come in at times, uh, romantic relationships, um, housing situations, uh, 
uh, certainly school itself um, uh, and classes uh, can be it. But then, you know, students don't step out of life and come to college either. And um, so um, they, it's rather interesting how many people, unfortunately, experience deaths and serious uh, medical illnesses and, and those kind of issues as well. Um, so that's, uh, that's on top of some of those other kind of new factors that we're seeing as far as technology and such. Um, and you had one more question, but I'm blanking on it. Previously diagnosed it with anxiety disorder or depression, and then oh right, come into our you know family. And it could be either way. Okay. I mean, there are some students that uh, stay engaged with their uh, therapists, their psychiatrists. Sometimes that is during break. That's when they connect. Uh, sometimes they're doing it by phone. Um, it, you know, it depends. But uh, many students are uh, now geographically located in a in a way that it's more convenient for them, or I shouldn't say even convenient. It's more crucial for their care to be seen in a local uh, vicinity, and that's why we really need it uh, available for all campuses. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Kindy. Regent Amari, Regent Powell, I want to speak a little bit to the academic stressors and and how. Uh, do we know we are not causing stress? We only have to look, I think, to the case study that was shared with us in the presentation with the Rochester student to know that a number of students come to us highly successful from high school and experience different challenges when they come to a college campus. And though I'm not an expert in this area, my colleagues who are tell me that students have had, in many cases, very successful coping strategies in high school, that those coping strategies help them be successful in their courses in spite of learning disabilities or mental health challenges. And then when they come to campus where the level of uh, rigor and demand might be increased and our students come to us from very different high school preparation backgrounds and they are challenged um, at a level that is new to them and those coping mechanisms don't always work when they come to campus. So it's not necessarily that we're being um, overly stressful in our teaching. In some cases, I do think there are changes that our faculty could make. It is also simply that the college environment is so much more uh, rigorous that what used to work doesn't work, and so many students find themselves reaching out for the very first time ever. I see my colleagues here nodding as I say these things. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to Student Representative Malarvinen, then Regent Cohen, and then Regent Lucas. Thank you, Chair Murray. Uh, first, I would like to thank you for the information presented here um, and the improvements that students have seen in re the resources and provisions for student health and wellness across the campus. I want to continue to call to attention the inequities that continue to pervade the system, however. Access to resources on the system campuses, particularly in regards to mental health and disability services, remains uneven, as we indicated in our student re represented report to the Board of Regents um, last month. Last year, $363,400 were allocated to mental health resources across the campus, across the system. Um, and how, I just want to know how exactly was this money allocated? Uh, for example, how, how was this money allocated to Crookston? Um, my second point that I want to make is that going forward, I want to highlight the necessity of taking an intersectional approach to mental health. Different communities approach and navigate mental health differently for reasons of culture, class, gender identity, and so on. And as we take an ecological approach to mental health, we must be cognizant of the different ways in which the communities that students come from affect the ways in which they navigate mental health. Services like Let's Talk, I think, are really useful in reaching historically underrepresented represented communities, but I think there has to be a greater focus in hiring counselors and hiring staff that come from these historically underrepresented communities so we can reach these communities of students in the future. Thank you, student representative. So the, the way that the funds were, were dispersed. Um, Regent Omar, if I can uh, address that, and Representative Malab I'm sorry, Malavar, and thank you for your question. And the student reps continuing interest in this really important topic. I think we've moved forward as an institution and across all of our campuses because students have really raised these concerns and brought it not just to the board, but to each of us on our campuses to make sure that we're doing right by all of our students across each of our campuses around mental health. Um, during the last budget compact process, last year a number of our campuses put forward requests to the system officers and the budget 
Budget 5 that reviewed the budget allocations asking for additional resources because we knew that this was a priority for our campuses. The campuses also need to balance what's happening in the other um, economic realities that we're working within, and so people have prioritized those needs in different ways and work to address them in different ways. Um, and Barbara can certainly speak to Crookston. Um, we had made the request for Morris that would help us do some of the preventative and holistic health pieces. Um, we were addressing the increased need for counseling in some ways through student fee access, but we also wanted to have some resources to pilot some of the things like the um, collaboration that's been really successful with Dr. Herman from Boynton Mental Health around psychiatry, which was a real gap for us, and so saw the value of linking with the system. So we requested funds to support that initiative, to support some deeper integration of preventative work and um, building well-being skills for all students at Morris, and then to um, look further at how we could go forward with that. And I think each campus prioritized the things that we thought would make the biggest difference for our students. We didn't think that we were requesting everything that we needed, but trying to look at what would make the biggest difference right now for students. Thank you. Do you want to comment at all? I, I will try and comment. Thank you. Um, uh, on the Crookston resource question, um, our approach in the budget uh, request this last time was to be a, a little bit bigger and bolder in our ask that would have allowed us to address a good number of issues that we have. Mental health resources certainly would have been among those. The resources that we all receive are not sufficient to meet all of our needs, and therefore we were fortunate um, and intentional in seeking some philanthropic support so that we could increase our uh, counseling center services. One of the things that we try and do, and I'm, I don't know how this works on the other campuses, our disabilities resource person sits very close to our counseling center people. And so while we don't have case manager and we need one, they sit close enough to each other that they are able to collaborate when um, a student presents with, a, with conditions because comorbidity, especially with disability services and mental health, is increasing. And so the complexity of the issues that we're facing continue to grow. The, the lack of um, psychiatry services, the fact that we have a wonderful partnership with Northwest Mental Health um, still does not help us meet all of the needs with which our students present. Thank you. Uh, Regent Cohen and then Regent Lucas. Uh, thank you, Chair Amari, and thank you, presenters, uh, for a really interesting and, and important discussion. And I know, having met with some of the students, what a what a crucial issue this is. So I want to focus just on the mental health for a minute. Um, I really appreciate all the work that was done and what you showed that some of some of the wait lists have been diminished or some erased even, uh, which I think is really great. Uh, there have been many new hires. Um, we do know that the mental health issues, as all of you have said, are going to keep increasing. And so my question, one comment, one question, comment is I urge you to keep paying attention to that. And, and uh, my com question is how, besides requesting money in the budget, which is, I suppose, the main way that you try to deal with it, what other ways are you thinking about dealing with the increase uh, that we know is coming? Thank you, Regent Cohen. Dr. Christensen? Yes, uh, Regent Omari, Regent Cohen. Um, first of all, we have really changed and had a much more proactive approach right now. So when we expanded our space for mental health, I can only speak for the, the Twin Cities campus at this point, um, but when, ex when we expanded our space, we expanded it such that we anticipated uh, additional hires. Um, we are planning to have another four uh, therapists add this next year, next year because we will have wait lists if we don't continue to hire at the current rate of 20, 25% growth uh, in demand 
each year. Each year, uh, at the same time, um, and and part of you know yes, there were money requests there. Unfortunately, because we uh, are able to um, rely on third party payers, um, uh, we uh, only need to have forty percent of those positions uh, covered. That's still a request to the fees, uh, student fees, and that's how we fund it. Um, but we also make important decisions about reallocating, so we could have used that space for something else, and uh, that we uh, that we were able to obtain. Um, and so our priority has been to uh, address mental health right now because we know that's what the demand is. We're not getting a high demand right now for increased uh, primary care services, for example, uh, or other services. Um, so that's how we're trying to address it. And then, of course, really trying to look at other preventive strategies, uh, ways that we can also uh, have our services expand. So Learn to Live not only is a service that someone can use independently, in fact, 70% of those that go into the therapy modules are doing it uh, independently. In other words, they are not connected with therapy, but 30% are. And um, what that means that expands is the opportunity to get more sessions in. So the therapist will actually work with the student and use that as an additional tool, which augments um, our resources as well. So those are some of our strategies. Thank you. Regent Omari, Regent Cohen, it's a great question. Um, it's exciting to see in Duluth that the addition of two counselors means we can pay attention to more outreach activities, which we had to sacrifice when you're really nose down on meeting with students. So just yesterday I met with a faculty member in our business school uh, who is writing a grant to bring a mental health first aid program to campus. And we could train faculty and staff across the campus on doing a better job of recognizing the signs of, of some distress and referring more quickly. In addition, the, ex the additional time our counselors will have means this summer we're going to retreat and really look at the provost committee that she's put together with faculty and see if we can't replicate some of those great efforts to bring more awareness to our faculty across campus on how they can structure curriculum to be more supportive of uh, students in, in, this, in this way. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. And Ms. Thornton, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair O'Mari and Regent Cohen. Um, at the University of Minnesota Rochester, um, our focus is on health sciences, and I, I, I suppose it's no surprise that many of our students come because they've had health experiences that have motivated them to study this. So we have many students who choose Rochester because the Mayo Clinic is right there. Um, and we're also a small place. You got to see it last time and know that many of us wear multiple hats, so we need to be a very collaborative campus. And so similar to what Lisa was saying at Duluth is trying to train everybody on these topics. So we have what we call, a, we are a community of well-being. Um, and though some might think that's a little hokey, um, it's actually really valuable because everybody is focused on well-being. So um, the, and then with that, with the wearing multiple hats, our director of counseling is also our counselor. And our director of disability services is the person who's working with the students to developing um, accommodations. So she and he have to work with everybody to make sure our students are getting served. So this idea of community of well-being is very alive on our campus. Thank you. Regent Lucas. Thank you, Chair Omari. Um, this has been such an interesting discussion. And it's led me to go back to an article that I read, and I didn't read it too deeply. So, um, But it was about, I think it was Harvard, that offered a class on happiness. Mm -hmm. And it sounds kind of fluffy, especially for Harvard, but the class was oversubscribed, uh, standing room only, very, very successful. And I throw that in sort of the category of prevention. You know, you go there and you learn techniques on to, for taking care of yourself, and I suppose things come out of the spirituality world and so forth. And I'm just wondering if we've looked at that, because uh, I, I believe it's Harvard's planning to offer this again and again. Well, they just come to Regents meetings, and then they're happy. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw all the hands at the table go up. <laughs> um, let, let's start with Vice Chancellor Olson Loy, please. Thank you, Regent Omari. Thank you, Regent Lucas, for that good observation. Uh, one of the things that we have going on at Morris right now is looking at national models of where institutions are doing good work around really infusing well-being strategies into their curriculum and the co-curriculum. When we saw a real jump in the number of students who were coming in telling us that they had already been diagnosed with anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues, and you saw our data in terms of over a third of our students reporting that they have experienced a mental health condition at some point in their lives. 
we just said we needed a population level response to this that we can't just be helping to we certainly need to have intervention when students are struggling but we need to do more to help all of our students build our capacity to navigate um, life and to be more successful academically and in the world and so of a team of students faculty and staff who are looking at the models that exist um, Carleton College has been a part with St. Olaf College and uh, public health people within Rice County and piloting a program that they call happy hour which um, has 10 modules in it that are based in evidence-based positive psychology work including some of the happiness work and rolling that out to students we've looked at some of the things from the Twin Cities through the Bakken Center for Health and Spirituality and some of the courses offered for credit for students there um, the George Mason University is being recognized as the nation's first well-being university and mm -hmm. so learning from them one of our graduates from Morris is the senior student affairs officer at Georgetown University and they have a curriculum infusion program around mental health and well-being and so looking at those models and determining over the next year and a half what the Morris model for what uh, mental health and well-being infusion will be and also how we bring that up for our faculty and staff and so we're modeling good health and wellness and good behaviors for our students and figuring out how to use that into our student life and academic life right now a lot of our programs are opt in programs for students and we want to provide the resources more consistently to the students who might not know that they would really benefit from them it's a great question thank you and Regent Rosho wants the last comment he telepathed a message to me that is going to be brief <laughs> no brief thank you mr. chair um, good conversation I, I, I feel like I you know uh, make make a request to the chair to, to consider a, an additional opportunity because I think that there's a lot more we can uh, explore on this topic considering how it has really exploded in in recent years as a as an issue of concern and and I've got you know uh, a number of things that I um, would like to discuss uh, with our experts at some point if we have that opportunity uh, including things like expectations and how things have just changed so dramatically um, but I I will just leave with this comment I as we go forward on this topic you know, I, I, I keep wanting to pull back and sort of you know take a, a broader approach to this and think about the university and its role um, because you know certainly when I was 18 I felt like I was a grown-up and I was you know interacting with the world as you know it, no different if I was at the university than if I just went out and got employment and started a family and did all those things was as people as certainly in my parents generation did quite commonly um, but I look at the university's role as it, as it relates to preparing students uh, for their lives, whether it's teaching them to be citizens or giving them job skills and that sort of that dialogue as to what our role is as, a, as an institution. I would like to also take a perspective um, on this topic. What's happening to students after they leave the university? Because if we're just throwing resources at the, the issue while they're here, but we're not providing an opportunity for people to succeed when they move past here, I don't know if we're necessarily doing as well as we need to be doing. So, just throwing that out there, Mr. Chair, that I would I would love to see us develop a way of uh, you know we we certainly track whether people are employed uh, after graduation and how things are going in that respect. I'd be very interested in how the data is reflected um, as we go forward. It's obviously going to be an evolving uh, data set, but. Uh, to know that we're doing right here, I'd like to know if we're doing right by those same people after they move beyond here. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Rocha. And and you make a, a very valid point that this is going to be an ongoing conversation. And since I'm chairing the committee, I have two more regents who are demanding that they want to talk. So uh, the chair of the board, McMillan, can fire me if we're too late at the end of the day today. Regent Johnson and then Regent Swiggum. Uh, thank you, Regent Omari and presenters. Um, I've been thinking and listening to uh, your comments and observations, and uh, when I'm done, you're going to say, well, that region's an old curmudgeon. He doesn't get it. I hope I do get it. Um, I'll just call it mental toughness. Let me give you a perspective. I, I will tell you I'm seven years old. I grew up in a farm in southeastern Minnesota. Mom, dad, and my brother, and my dad always talked to me about being tough, metal tough. I went off to college and he said, you have four years and graduate, and I don't wanna hear any problems, just graduate. Well, I struggled in college, but I kept in the back of my mind being really <clears throat> tough. What I'm getting at is how do we teach our children or grandchildren how to live? 
I think that's very important. And this doesn't only go to our students, it goes to parents and grandparents as well. And I don't want to be judgmental or indicative of you know, what's gone wrong. I'm trying to analyze this because I think it has genetics, environment, it has sociology, it has a whole scope of things that bring us to this point. As you were talking, I look at the graphs and I see you know, one out of three you know, requests for some kind of, kind of uh, help. I say to myself, what, what have we brought ourselves to? These are some of the best and brightest in our state and country and yet are struggling with mental health issues. And I don't mean that to be punitive or judgmental. I mean, why are we in this place? And I have a partial answer is we haven't taught ourselves how to live. How to relate to one another in an honest in an honest way, because if I relate to my colleagues here, or to my family, or to whoever, whoever in an honest way, I think I have a better mental health. It's an honest approach to life, and so sometimes we don't always be honest with one another, and it's okay to be honest <coughs> with, with respect. So I ask the question: How did we get to this place? And when we feel mental pain, what do we do about it? Sometimes we abuse alcohol, sometimes we abuse drugs, sometimes we abuse other people, sometimes we say things to people we ought not to. That's what, and I agree with uh, Regent Rocha, we can have all the information, all the technology, all the academics, all the degrees, but if we do not know how to live personally and with one another, it's of, of little value you know, going, going forward in our society. So I think you know those things, but at the same time, I come back to what can an individual, he or she, manage themselves in the matters of living and what is external, what is coming at us you know, from the outside. I don't expect a response, it's just uh, observation about life and how we might move ahead. Thank you. Anyone? Dr. Christensen? Oh, first, yes. Uh, th thank you, uh, Regent Murray, Regent Johnson. Um, it's a very uh, thank you for your, your observations and your comments. Um, uh, I think it, they are uh, definitely worth considering, and this is probably a I'm going to try to answer in a few seconds rather than the five hour uh, response that probably it deserves. Um, Yes, there's a lot of societal issues here, and uh, I think we have to, you know, consider what those are. Um, I think that uh, if, if we look at our population, we have to realize that part of the reason that we're seeing more students that have a history of mental illness is the success of a system of identifying some students earlier that would have never made it to college before. So we have actually more students succeeding now than previously. I would also say that some of the interventions that we're using, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, basically works at re, you know, reevaluating a situation and looking at other ways you could think about it, and, and particularly not uh, coming to conclusions inappropriately. I've always thought that cognitive behavioral therapy, we should just drop the therapy part because it's useful for everybody. It gets at the toughness. The other thing is I think we really should be measuring things like resilience and positive um, psychology, um, uh, you know, things of that. Um, thriving is a measurement. Now, we actually have a figure for thriving for the University of Minnesota campus. Uh, for I believe this was the Twin Cities. I don't know if this was system-wide. That was the, uh, uh, we did the uh, Healthy Mind study here a few uh, years ago, and the, it uh, came up with, let's see, 42%, I believe, 42, 43% of our students were said to be thriving based on their, their scale. And that takes into account on how you, um, relationships, uh, self-esteem, um, uh, engagement issues like that. Um, th that figure is concerning to me. I mean, it suggests that we have a lot to do. But, and, and some things we can't do on our campus because we are talking about 18 years of, of experience. We're talking about society. But we have students now that are going to be going out in the world. And, and there was a comment, I can't remember if, if it was you, Regent Johnson, that said about going out to the, to the world because we know that sometimes our services are actually much better than what they're going to counter out there and the support and things like that. We get that feedback. Um, but we have the opportunity to make to help students be more resilient and to be able to deal with the world better. So I think their comments are really, uh, really useful in that way as far as how we should be focusing some of our resources. So thank you. Uh, Vice Chancellor Olson-Loy, please. 
Just a brief comment. Thank you, Regent Omari and uh, Regent Johnson, for your comments. I just want to acknowledge also the student representative, Mella Barnes, um, very astute comments earlier that we also need to recognize with all of this the diversity and intersectionality of the experiences of our students before they arrive in college. Some of our students, especially from underrepresented populations, have overcome significant challenges and issues and have life experiences that um, really demonstrate their level of mental toughness just to get here and that um, including people who have been in refugee situations, people who have communities with historic trauma embedded in their experiences and um, you may still deal with anxiety or other portions of mental health related to that, um, but I don't want to take anything away from the toughness that those students already demonstrate by being here. Thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor. Uh, Regent Swigum, please. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I, I will be brief. On the, on the heels of uh, Regent Johnson's question, and he and I did not talk about this at all, but I, I don't want to undermine the great importance of, of, of uh, uh, health and wellness programs and the programs that we provide to our students. I don't want to undermine them at all, but I found in life a, a, a little stress, a little pressure, a little anxiety is good. I think it's part of the process, to be very, very honest. Uh, I know that I've personally performed better in life. My bet is you have when I'm under a little pressure, when I'm under a little stress from some aspect of my life. Um, and I, I don't want to undermine the importance of the, of the programs when I say that. But, but it's part of life and it's part of the process, I believe that. Um, my question, I think, Dr. Christensen, though, is to you as, as we look at more resources for health and wellness programs, and your comment during your presentation was, uh, um, I think the quality of the services are generally strong. Mm -hmm. I think that's what you said. Mm -hmm. Tell me how you measure that. I, I would expect you to say that because you're the head of the program. <laughs> didn't say that I'd be shocked I'd be amazed but are these uh, the quality of the service is generally strong is that all subjective is it objective uh, as you ask for re for more resources I like to provide resources to those that perform uh, okay uh, give me why do you say generally strong tell us why dr. Christensen um, thank you uh, Regent Omari and Regent Spigum. Um, well, we do evaluate our, our resources. Um, we do use a page, patient satisfaction survey, for example. And uh, as far as uh, overall satisfaction, uh, we score very high as far as our mental health encounters. And um, the vast majority of our students uh, say as far as their therapist or their psychiatrist that they would recommend that therapist or psychiatrist to someone else. Um, there are some you know measures as well uh, that we look at. In fact, the state uh, requires us to look at a few things. For example, the uh, response rates to depression. And um, so we do follow that. Now, actually, the challenge with that is response rate to depression, once you get to, say, major depression, unfortunately is as high, isn't as high as we would hope we could get at. Um, but we generally perform fairly well there, too. So we do measure uh, in, in that regard. And I believe that all of the counseling services have some form of satisfaction survey or putting one in place. So maybe I could ask if someone else wants to comment. And if, please. Regent Omar, I actually want to circle back, and I, although he's left the room, uh, Regent Shu asked about marijuana use, and the figure here is wrong as well. It's 19.7 rather than 26.7, so we're not as out of whack. As, and thanks to the power of the internet, I was able to get it. <laughs> thank you. Well, with that, uh, uh, presenters, thank you for uh, all of the, the content and hard work that you all are doing. Uh, it's important uh, that we keep in mind uh, student representative Malarvinen's point about cultural backgrounds and um, those who are coming into the offices, making sure that we're meeting the needs of, of everyone that comes into the offices. This is an ongoing conversation. I want to underscore that. Um, and with um, a quick uh, eye contact from uh, the chair of the board, I have to apologize to um, Vice President Kramer and Vice President uh, Levine and the provost. We'll be pushing the fourth agenda item on the 24th, 21st century outreach mission uh, to uh, the June meeting uh, because this topic is of utter importance as is our next item, promotion and tenure. So thank you.
So I'll turn to Provost Hansen for any opening remarks on the next agenda item. Uh, thank you, Chair Murray. This is the annual report on a, a very important process. It, it is the, the real cornerstone of quality of, of the University of Minnesota. Evaluating faculty across the university system for promotion and tenure, as well as evaluating academic professionals for continuous appointments. The Board of Regents policy on faculty tenure defines who our faculty are. There are two types of faculty that in the uh, Regents policy. Regular faculty who have tenure or are eligible for tenure and term faculty who are appointed annually or for several years. Uh, the latter are not eligible for tenure. All individuals with faculty rank have to engage in scholarship, teaching, and service or public engagement. There may be a different mix of these activities depending upon the nature of the appointment, the um, place of the, of the faculty member in the course of a long career. But regular uh, faculty engage in more research typically, uh, balanced with teaching and service, and contract faculty typically do more teaching or clinical practice or service balanced with research. In fact, the largest number of contract faculty are clinicians hired in the academic health center, particularly in the medical school. Uh, as we look at this spring meeting at tenure, we always want to remind you that uh, tenure is a, is a long evaluative process. The hiring decision is, in fact, the first tenure and promotion decision. We hire people we think we will be able to promote and tenure. Uh, faculty come from the best programs in the country um, and around the world to the University of Minnesota. And once hired, junior faculty begin what's called a probationary period. During that time, they have to establish a program of independent scholarship or research. They have to publish peer-reviewed articles, books, book chapters, produce creative works, um, uh, write and receive um, uh, grants. They have to be effective teachers uh, and advisors in a variety of settings. They have to work to produce a, um, a, a, a national reputation or an international reputation. Um, the, the, there are university criteria for tenure, but each unit as well sets its own criteria and standards which specify in more detail exactly what's expected given the character of the uh, field. Um, so the faculty of each unit, the tenured faculty of each unit, establish the kinds of teaching, research, or creative activity or service and public engagement that are expected in that field. You know, obviously something like research excellence is, is defined differently in something like chemical engineering um, than it is in, say, architecture or history or philosophy, the kinds of places that you're expected to publish, the kinds of uh, grants you're expected to get, the kinds of work you're expected to produce. The, the, the research products are different depending upon the field and the people in the field know best how to specify the products that make a difference. Probationary, that is pre-tenure faculty, have detailed annual reviews uh, to determine if they'll be reappointed. Those are serious reviews each year done by their peers. The reviews are based on both the university and the unit criteria for um, uh, uh, work in the field. And the, again, with this an eye toward whether or not someone is making progress toward tenure. Uh, we usually discuss in this spring meeting promotion and tenure together, but they are, of course, not the same thing. There are three professorial ranks for regular and for contract faculty, um, but only regular faculty can have tenure, as we mentioned. 
for promotion um, to professor with tenure, we have the, the most rigorous standards. Um, they ha uh, people who are being promoted to full professor have to have made significant progress beyond that for associate professor with tenure. They have to have established a national or international reputation. And that's documented, discerned and documented by having external reviewers. External reviewers describe the impact of the individual's work, the extent to which it's known, the extent to which it shapes the field, and there are other markers of whether or not someone has um, uh, established a national or international reputation, the extent to which they're invited speakers at important national meetings and international meetings in their field, the extent to which they serve as editors of the work of record in the field, um, whether or not they head up research study sections at our, our national granting agencies like the NIH or the NSF. Um, artists, for example, will be expected to be having showings in national or international galleries. There are lots of ways of documenting the impact that someone has made on a field, but that's what they need to do, and they need to do it relevant in some way that's relevant to their field. The criteria for promotion for contract faculty um, are uh, slightly different. They look at faculty activities, but they may go beyond that into things like clinical practice. The criteria are different than they are for regular faculty, but again, they are very rigorous. Um, the, the, the key aspect for, that you know, ensures the rigor for, for regular and contract faculty is this process of external review. The reviewers are leaders in the fields and top departments in universities, and they're, they are chosen with an eye to that, and they document the, in the promotion and tenure dossiers the extent to which these people have these um, reputations and standing. They, ha they themselves have to have national, the reviewers, national and international reputations for their research or other creative activity. And they have to be at arm's length from the, um, the people who are being evaluated so that they really are evaluating not friends or, or you know, co-investigators, but people um, whose reputation has been made through their publications or um, other elements of, of research uh, activity. Exter our external reviewers really do come from the most prestigious universities in the world, and they provide detailed letters that evaluate the scholarship and creative work of the faculty. That's a sort of crucial element of this, because many of the layers of review, obviously, are not um, uh, such that they come from those fields. So we rely on the reputations of others, and then their detailed documentation and argumentation about whether or not somebody deserves uh, promotion or tenure. Um, this slide, um, the next slide, um, gives a little ac a brief account of what a dossier looks like. These dossiers are often hundreds and hundreds of pages long, so this is really a brief um, outline of it, but it describes the elements, a CV, uh, the statements the candidate makes about the various aspects of their um, professional work, research, teaching, and service data from their uh, classes, student ratings, and peer reviews of teaching, and uh, sometimes internal letters and always uh, external letters and samples of scholarship. The next slide shows the uh, process of review and the number of, of layers of review. Uh, so the candidate prepares a dossier, often with the help of his or her department, uh, that uh, some elements of the dossier are uh, sent to external reviewers. The unit reviews everything that comes back is assembled in that dossier, including the external reviews, and then reviews and votes on the candidate. There is then a second layer of um, uh, uh, examination of the dossier, typically at a college or campus level, and then the dean or the chancellor also makes a review, and then it goes into um, the vice provost for faculty and academic affairs, and then to me. That's uh, the process for the Crookston, Morris, Rochester campuses, and the Twin Cities campus. Candidates from the Duluth campus follow a slightly different process um, according to their union contract. The recommendation for tenure and promotion is made by the chancellor and is sent to the provost to include with the other recommendations to you today. So. I want to ask uh, Vice Provost Rebecca roper Solomon to provide more details about this year's promotion and tenure dossier. Let's have questions. 
you want to comment, ask a sure, question now, or wait until? If I could ask a question before we go on to the um, the details of the, of the promotions, please, Regent Powell. So it really has to do with the how we um, get to you know what we need in terms of newly appointed professors. I mean, I am assuming that it's we look at retirements. Uh, we look at newly created um, position, positions that have come about as a result of decisions to expand departments or, or that we need new capabilities or funded either internally or they could be externally endowed chairs. But is, as, I mean, so I guess the assumption is as part of all this process, there's a, we assess, you know, this year, 2019 academic year, we need X, you know, newly endowed professors based on all those factors. So, so I'm, I guess I'm just looking for your comments on the sort of demand side of the, of, if you will, of, the, of this process. So you, you, Regent Powell, you're referring to the re early on recruitment before they even enter into the 10 Well, no, it's, it, it more has to do with what, how do we decide, uh, what process do we use to decide um, how many new professors we need in any given year and where do they go? Mm -hmm. Provost Hanson. Uh, Chair Omari, uh, Regent Powell, that's really a decision typically made at the at the decanal level, uh, or it might be made at the chancellor level at the at the um, uh, smaller campuses. But it it's a, it's a, a matter of seeing where uh, there's student demand. Also, uh, maybe a matter of seeing where new fields are developing, and it's also frankly often made it, um, by deans with a judgment about what their strongest departments are and how they might be made even stronger. Um, uh, there's a, a need to kind of cover the curriculum, which has been you know, decided upon in a different sort of participatory process, but it, it, it's, it's a decanal decision about the allocation of resources. If indeed there's something like an endowed chair that's um, arrived at through, in some ways, negotiation, between the, the institution and the donor, uh, so that presumably we don't accept endowed chairs in fields that don't make sense for us, but we know where our needs are, and, and, and so uh, deans and others are active in trying to solicit support for endowments for faculty positions in areas of need, um, and areas of strength, typically. Uh, but it's, it's a decision that's made based on fine details about the, the quality and the needs of the the unit uh, that's that's at stake. Thank you. Uh, Regent Shu, and then we're going to come back to uh, Vice Provost Rebecca Hillman. Uh, thank you, Chair Amari, uh, Provost Hanson. Uh, I, I, I have a similar question, but I was coming at it more from a, a cost and financial perspective. Do we ever look at, you know, what our long-term cost is for you know, having more tenured professors or less tenured professors in a particular area, and how do we, you know, in some cases we're making a 40-year commitment um, for some of these people, and that adds up to a lot of money. And, you know, without kind of an idea of where we're going, I don't know how we, I mean, we can make these decisions just based on how good they are, but is there always a place for this, these people? Uh, do departments have um, an idea of how um, this year we're looking at whatever it is, 132. Do we know that we have the financial resources uh, for those 132 going forward? Provost Anza. Regent Omari and uh, Regent Shu. Yes, those, there are evaluative processes that are always going on, again, between um, uh, the budget office, the provost's office, the, and the deans, and then the deans with their various departments and individual faculty. Uh, the, there's, a, there, there's evaluation with every college every year, for example, on this campus between um, me and vice provosts about the size of programs. That obviously will, will make a difference. In, enrollments in, in the programs and the areas within programs or, or departments where there are, is increasing demand or decreasing demand so that we are constantly monitoring that and then it is expected that there will be something like a decanal decision about about whether or not to put resources in one direction or another. It, it's certainly the case that within most 
uh, departments, faculty, you know, would would always like more faculty. They 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 want colleagues, and they know that there are important things being done in their field. But those are always winnowed through the requests that they have to make for approval to hire from their own colleges. And that's the point at which most of those decisions are made. And and uh, there is no question that the deans of colleges get many many more requests to hire than they than they. Um, permit to go forward because they are managing their resources. So it looks like there's a huge appetite to have conversations about the process now. Thanks, Regent Powell. Uh, we're going to go <laughs> to <laughs> President Kaler uh, and then to a few other regents. Thank you, uh, Chair Omari. Uh, just two bits of color that the, the regents may find useful. One is, um, indeed, as Regent Xu intimated, um, we do suffer from two different time scales. The demand for, from an undergraduate programmatic point of view tends to wax and weighing on about the same um, schedule as the economy. So every eight to ten years or so, there's a surge in, in students interested in, in particular fields, and those tend to wane. And that's incommensurate with the with the tenure and 40-year and life cycle that a faculty member might have. And that's just a, a fact of higher education that, that we, we try to deal with. Um, the other bit of color is, um, I'll use an athletic analogy, there's always a, a a tension between choosing a faculty member who is the equivalent of the best athlete available, so someone who will be a terrific scholar, even if that may not match exactly with what the programmatic needs of a, of a college uh, might be, and that's probably more acute in the sciences and engineering than, than it certainly it might be in the humanities. Um, so it's that tension versus uh, you need a quarterback, so you need somebody who has a certain set of research skills to fill a spot on the team. And um, those uh, sometimes are in conflict. So just some color that you might find useful. Thank you. Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, um, presenters. In um, months past or years past, we've, we've, we have looked at the data about the percentage of tenured faculty in relation to the total number of <coughs> Here, and that has gone down significantly, and that you know that does allow management uh, more flexibility to deal with these these trends and these these patterns that inevitably hit the uh, university. And um, the other comment I'd make is that um, um, tenure. This is an important conversation, but I go back to the fact that no matter whether we're under a at will system or a or a uh, collective bargaining or civil service or Tenure, whatever system we're under, the most important activity here is hiring people correctly. The act of hiring covers all other sort of structures, and talking about that at a board level and forcing staff and they, you know, about what those best practices are. What are those? What are those? Uh, what are those? Because it's just they are almost always. Long-term decisions, and it's, it's. And I've learned. We all know that from business and from our our occupations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you, uh, Regent Beeson, and and I think one piece that you talk about in that ratio component and the, the need to have tenured faculty so that we can accomplish the three parts of our mission, right? So if we have tenured faculty who are doing research, they can bring that into the classroom and they can engage with the community as well. So making sure that that ratio that you bring up is is, uh, is very important. And the fact that uh, this impacts our rankings. And we know that we're in the world of rankings, whether you agree with it or not, we're in it. Um, and so there's a dynamic to that as well. Uh, Regent Swiggum. Um. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, uh, again, on the heels of Regent Sue, if I could, um, uh, Provost, uh, as we look at our various schools and I look at the list of tenure faculty, I, I'm aware just minimally that we have a little difficulty with financial uh, pressure in our law schools. Uh, for whatever reason, I've heard a few different reasons, but I've heard a few millions of dollars, even from Regent Sue himself, that we uh, had some troubles there. And I see we're granting tenure to two professors in the law school. Is that going to create less flexibility for us in what we need to do to address the, the, the uh, dollar uh, problems that we have in our law school? Uh, just help me that that's not going to create more problems for us in that specific school. 
Provost Hanson. Chair Omari, Regent Stegham. There's, it's, it's undeniable that there is uh, a commitment that's made at the time of tenure. Uh, but one of the things that uh, ensures it, it, that you might not have to worry about that quite as much as you um, might think, and, and it's, it's been evident in the law school, is if we hire well, and I agree, that is the first and most crucial point here, if we hire well and then evaluate well, uh, we have excellent faculty, many of whom are then um, under threat of rating constantly by other schools. We have lost an enormous number of faculty from the law school during this period of the downturn, and they've gone to Harvard, they've gone to Stanford because they're very good faculty members. Uh, uh, the, the situation with the law school is rather complicated because there are standards about what needs to be offered by an accredited law school. So we need faculty in various uh, areas, even if we are uh, in a period of, um, of uh, it decreased demand for um, enrollment in the law school. But we have a mitigation strategy for that, and we will be going into detail on that in the uh, budget committee this, this, at this meeting. I, I, I know that. I've looked at the agenda, uh, Provost. I, I just want to make sure that this is not going to create <clears throat> less flexibility or less pressures for what we might need to do or any decisions we have to make uh, in regarding to law. So I'm sure they're absolutely excellent, wonderful folks. I, I have no question about that. But you know what? We've got a little problem there that we're needing some flexibility with that, with that thing. Uh, uh, Chair Mario and Regents Figum, I, 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 it will not create less flexibility. The plan we have does not depend on denying tenure to those who've earned it. Regent Lucas. Thank you, Chair Amari. This is just an extreme example of what President Taylor was talking about with the uh, best athlete versus the need for a quarterback. Uh, when we went to parent weekend at Princeton, we were counseled to encourage our kids to major in something where a department where they had more Nobel laureates than students. And they got themselves into this pickle where everybody wanted to take, you know, political science and they had Nobel, Nobel laureates all over the place with no one to teach. It's extreme, but, you know, it's, uh, it's a little bit of what President Kaler was talking about. Thank you. Seeing no other uh, hands or wishes to comment, we will now, and I apologize, I said your first name earlier, uh, turn to Vice Provost uh, Roper Suman. Thank you, Chair Omari. I'll run through this relatively quickly because I have a feeling that there's much more conversation that people want to have. So these are just some of the details of this year's, this year's process. You see we have 180 total candidates that went through for promotion. 132 of those were on the tenure track or tenure system faculty. This slide shows the specific recommendations for contract faculty, and as Provost Hansen said earlier, most of these are in the medical school. This slide shows the specific recommendations for each faculty group for tenure and promotion. You'll see that 69 faculty were considered for tenure decision, and most of these were at the assistant professor level, which is what we would expect. 61 faculty were considered for promotion only, typically moving from associate professor with tenure to full professor with tenure. One assistant professor was recommended for non-reappointment, and one associate professor was recommended for continuation and rank. We added this slide last year, just, or this year, just to provide some new information so that you could see the balance of the, these cases as they were represented across all of our system campuses. One thing we really like to touch base with you on in our May meeting is what we call a tenure success rate, because it's important to recognize that although this year there was only one person who came up through the process and was, was essentially denied a tenure, it is absolutely not the case that everyone who was hired at the, you know, at the outset ends up in a tenured position here at the University of Minnesota. Instead, there are multiple levels. We go through a process of, of rigorous review and hiring. Each person goes through a, a rigorous annual review each year, at which point there may be some decisions to voluntarily leave or to be um, uh, uh, considered for early termination. And then we have this rigorous process at the, at the end of their probationary period. So uh, each year we present this tenure, what we call this tenure success rate, where we look at an entering cohort of assistant professors in a given year, follow them over seven years, uh, which is the typical probationary period, and then take a snapshot at a point in time. 
So they could, all of these folks who entered in in their probationary period could end up in one of these four categories. Either they received tenure and are still here, they received tenure but then left the university, left the university without tenure or are still here at the university on the tenure clock, either because they were granted an extension or because their, their particular unit has a longer tenure clock. So our tenure success rate then includes the percentage of tenure track faculty who received tenure and stayed, plus the percentage of tenure track faculty who received tenure and left. We then examine the tenure success rate over a three year period um, to make sure that we're ironing out any idiosyncrasies of a given year. And for this year, we're reporting a 57% um, tenure success rate. So continuous appointments are also evaluated um, at the University of Minnesota and fewer than 3% of academic professionals are in this category that we call continuous appointments. And as you can see from the slide, most of those individuals are working with the university libraries. <coughs> So this year there are three academic professionals, two assistant librarians, um, includes promotion to associate librarian, and then one teaching specialist in the law school who is also being promoted. Uh, Please. Chair Omari and, and um, members of the committee, we have a slate of recommendations to the committee uh, and we recommend them for board action, that the regular faculty candidates on the list be approved for tenure and promotion as indicated, the contract faculty candidates listed be approved for promotion to the rank indicated, and that the academic professional candidates listed receive continuous appointments and promotions as indicated. Thank you, Provost Hanson. And before I uh, obtain motions for, we'll take three different motions um, and I'll read them uh, before entertaining any motions. I offer any other, uh, or this opportunity for any other questions or comments on the process. Regent Hsu. Uh, thank you, Chair Omari. Um, I just have a, a question uh, regarding some things that um, we're dealing with recently, or we've dealt with recently in terms of uh, sexual assault, sexual harassment. How do we make sure that we're not taking on someone else's problem when we hire from another program or whatever? How do we really know um, what the backgrounds of of these candidates are if they came to us from somewhere else or if uh, you know if they might have something there that even though there's a glowing uh, recommendation from a particular institution that maybe they're just trying to offload their problem uh, on us and how do we deal with that and then uh, secondly just the technical question about how you calculate the tenure success rate um, by uh, adding two percentages together, are you saying that really the the best you can get is 200 percent, as opposed to 100 percent? So, Provost Hanson, do you want to start with the first question? Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair Omari and Regent Shu. Yes, I'll start with the first question. Um, we, in hiring. Um, you know, don't just take the applications. We uh, we we interview people. We uh, seek uh, not just the the dossier that they present to us, including hiring people who have jobs at the outside, the letters of recommendations they bring, and then their record of uh, of academic work. Uh, people contact other people in the field. Um, it's a very important decision for any department about whether or not to hire a colleague. So they tend to do a lot of due diligence on their own. Does that guarantee? guarantee that uh, we would never make a hiring mistake of that sort? No, it doesn't in our uh, institution any more than in any other institution. I have the feeling that the um, changes in the, the social expectations here that there is a lot, there, there will be fewer places to hide. As, as you know, uh, people are coming forward and go, going into the press with these things, in which case a simple Google search will often turn up something that's problematic. But uh, we are, um, you know, I think no better, no worse than any other uh, institution in this. Uh, and I think one of the things that makes such a difference is the way in which across any given field, people are in touch with one another and they see each other at meetings and so on. So there, there is less what you might think of as blind hiring or hiring off of a paper dossier alone than there might be in other fields. 
and and I think you know we it it should also be mentioned that you know we we can only work with the information that we have right and so in cases where maybe someone was investigated but that information because of personnel that is not public we might not have access to something like that so you follow so up on follow that up. on yeah. that piece yeah follow follow thank you chair Omari. so i guess what i was trying to get to is do we actually ask them if there are any issues um at previous institution and then, you know, obviously there are people coming forward every day with old allegations, you know, back to the 60s. Um, you know, I'm not saying that we should be able to catch those, but I mean, if we're not asking a question, then maybe we should ask a question if it's, you know, if it's legal, but I think it is. Provost Hanson. Uh, thank you, Chair Amari and Regent Shu. I don't know that we do ask that question at the point of hiring. That could be something we could consider. Thank you. Uh, Student Representative Malarvinen, please. Thank you, Chair Amari. Um, my question tends is more located within trying to delineate the difference between tenure or tenure track faculty and contract faculty. What exactly are the differences in compensation structures between them? And additionally, what exactly are the benefits and or obligations asso associated with an indefinite tenure at the university? Mm -hmm. Vice Provost. Yes, uh, student representative Malarvan, Malarvanen? Malarvanen. Malarvanen. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, it, yes, so, so both the contract faculty and the tenure system regular faculty are covered under our faculty tenure policy, so you can see information in there about both of those positions. Uh, in most cases, both of them have some research, teaching, and service expectations, although I will admit that that varies somewhat depending on their, their position and, and where they're located. Um, many of our contract faculty positions, as we presented earlier, are in the medical school. And as, as we've recently learned, um, there are they're actually exploring another position because they have such an emphasis and a value of clinical responsibilities that the tenure system faculty are, are um, have really quite high expectations related to research and grant getting and contract or clinical faculty will have some of those same expectations for research as well but not at the same level as, as uh, the regular system faculty in that unit. But again I do have to say that it varies depending on, on unit and position. Regent Cohen. Thanks, Chair Amari. Um, I want to make sure that I'm understanding and then have a question about the tenure success rate. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think you said it was 57 percent. Mm -hmm. And does that mean that from the cohort that we hired uh, after the six or seven years when people are granted tenure, that those who are granted tenure re either remain at the university or leave, but they have been granted tenure that it's, it's a little over half of the people we hire. And is that a usual reflection of how many one hopes? I mean, in some way, ways, it would seem to me that I would hope that 80% of the people we hire are so good that they stick around and, and they get tenure, but maybe I'd like some sort of more information on that. Vice Provost Roper Schumann. Yeah, Chair Omari and uh, Regent Cohen, I think that's a great question. I don't know that 50% is the, the ideal number, the magic number. I think one of, the, one of the things that we have to take into consideration with that is that it's not only that they're, um, for some it, it, was, it didn't end up being the right fit, and so they end up leaving for whatever reasons. But for others, it's that they were hired away from us. In fact, one of the things that we do by sending out these fabulous files to our peers in in similar fields across the, the nation and the world is that we advertise that we have these really wonderful faculty members and in some cases it's not unusual for people to say oh my goodness this wonderful person at the University of Minnesota we might invite them in to give a talk and we might see if they would be a good fit here too so I, I think we have to perhaps think about the number but also think about all of the the possible reasons for that that number and and I would love the number to be higher because I would love for us to make ideal wonderful hiring decisions, have it be a terrific fit, have that person be supported, and have that person come on as a, as a more or less permanent member of the institution. Thank you. Regent Powell. Well, thank you, Chair Amari, and this maybe is, continues on in this discussion, and just a clarification on the, on the external review process. Mm -hmm. So maybe briefly, what is that process? 
Sure, it's it's one of the most important and significant and heavily weighted aspects of the, the um, tenure review process. At this institution, we vary from anywhere from five letters would be at the very minimum to um, uh, some units have as many for, as 14 external review letters. People are requested um, to write evaluative letters, as Provost Hansen mentioned earlier. Uh, at least, we say in our policy, at least four of those have to be at arm's length, so people who you've not collaborated with, who are not your your PhD advisor, who you don't know well. Or at other institutions. At, oh, at, definitely at other institutions. and. In in some units, it's pretty standard to have people from not only within the United States, but also international in, uh, institutions as well. Um, people write really thoughtful, evaluative letters uh, that are then evaluated at the unit level, and then those letters become part of the file as it goes through all of the rest of our internal evaluation processes. But are there more specific aspects now? Okay. Good, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, please, Paul uh, Wilson. Thank you, Chair Amari and, and Regent Powell. And in the dossier, the, the reason the person was chosen is specified by the department, typically. Uh, they say why they would be good evaluators. And then in the letters, they, they have to list their credentials, or not really, they do it in some other way. They, their credentials are given so that other levels can evaluate those. And so when they um, provide comments, they also say something like, you know, Typically, like I, I have never worked with this person, but I've seen them give things at meetings. They say whatever um, sort of content they have, but then they evaluate the work. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Hanson. I have a question. Um, in audit, we'll be reviewing um, our, our risk profile and mitigation techniques, and one of the things that's mentioned in there is around uh, attracting and retaining faculty of color. And as I'm looking at table two in the document here, it's not in the presentation materials, but on page 107, we have a, a breakdown of uh, gender uh, and race and ethnicity for all faculty within this cohort that we're talking about today. So um, would you say, that the representation that we see uh, today that we're going to vote on is belongs in that risk profile that we see, or is this performing higher than what uh, a, a risk might suggest, considering you know three American Indians, uh, Indian professors, four black, three Hispanic? Um, could you comment on that? Either either one of you, or perhaps the president would like to comment. Or not? Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll start. Regent Omari, thank you for that. Um, th this is not an untypical uh, profile in Avon Year. This is something again that that uh, is. Is, is a place where we uh, take seriously the, uh, the admonition that Regent Beeson gave us. The first and most important thing is to go out and make sure that we are uh, uh, keeping in mind diversity as we're hiring. But it is also a matter of having a climate where people can do their best work and we do support <coughs> those people in the pipeline. This is not untypical, but we would like to, be, to do better. President Kaler, any comments on that front? Uh, Chair Omar, I'm just looking at this uh, now, and if, if we look at the total of 180, uh, we have 74 women, so roughly 40%, uh, not 50%. But indeed, we continue to struggle uh, with creating a diverse enough um, faculty, uh, particularly uh, black and Hispanic faculty members, and that's uh, a challenge, unfortunately. Uh, that we share with many other institutions of higher education. Thank you. Regent Anderson? A, a very brief question. Thank you, uh, Chair Omari. Does the beginning of the tenure track cycle come from a recommendation from the individual college or the individual dean himself? Is that where that original comes from? Uh, Regent Omari and, and uh, Regent Anderson, uh, it, it in a way hiring onto the tenure track happens at the decanal level. They give authorization to hire onto the tenure track, so that the minute someone is hired, they are. Uh, it's understood through that process that it's a tenure track job. Thank you, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> uh, a couple comments. One is, um, you know, this is. It's great information, and when you look, and you know, this is just a list of names on a piece of paper. But it just strikes me what a what a momentous moment it is for these individuals. You know, what a big big moment in their lives, and as professionals and and scholars. And so I'm I'm excited for each of them, despite the fact that I probably know very few, if any of them. 
And so um, I'm excited for that. Um, one of the, the real quick question, and, and I haven't really had a chance to, to delve into this uh, during these past several years um, uh, back on the board. Um, I have heard conversation about uh, uh, folks that are concerned about our reliance on instructors um, in the process of educating uh, our student body. How, do, how does this, and, and, and without even necessarily going into the wisdom or lack thereof of one strategy versus another uh, economically and um, acad um, in terms of academic pursuit, um, how does this particular cohort of, of tenure uh, determinations compare to the, the long-term sort of volume that we would normally see and how does that relate to our reliance on faculty versus instructors versus people of different categories for providing instruction to the students as well as conducting the research of the institution. Vice Provost Robert Hillman. Yes, Chair Omari and, and uh, Regent Rosha, I want to make sure I'm understanding your question. You said tenure terminations? No, no, no. Terminations. De 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 Determinations. I'm sorry, I misunderstood you. Um, so I think the broader, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer it in terms of this particular year's decisions, to be honest, um, because I think we have to look at it more holistically. The, the challenge of having the percentage, getting the percentage right of people who perform various personnel functions at the institution is, is probably one of the most significant ones that we can think about. Um, at the same time, I think we need to recognize that we do indeed need to have people performing different kinds of functions in order to fulfill all aspects of our mission. One thing that um, I think has been very useful toward that end is this year we're wrapping up what's called an academic personnel plan process in which each of the colleges and campuses needed to come together and present to the provost, um, and I was in on those meetings as well, uh, how they're thinking about their personnel, how they can anticipate their needs going forward, and how they can make sure that they have the right balance of tenured system, tenured, uh, tenure track faculty, as well as instructors. Um, I think it is also important, and we saw this more and more through the unionization effort that we came out of um, last October, that we need to make sure that we're paying attention to and valuing all of the people who are in the various roles at, at our institutions. I can just do a follow up, Chair. Thank you, Chair. The comment I'll make, you know, and thank you, that's a, I think, a, a helpful response. Um, one of our great arguments for support from the state and in, in identifying how we're differentiated from other uh, institutions in the state is the fact that our students have access to the you know the, the the premier scholars and researchers and so on and so yeah I just want to make sure that if, if we do move you know continue to move more toward a instructor model versus you know ensuring that our faculty have an expectation of time in the classroom you know imparting that that cutting edge wisdom to our students it would it would create an inconsistency with what we're you know saying about the institution versus what we're necessarily providing so I would just make that comment as we go forward thank you Provost Hansen um, th thank you Chair Amari and, and um and thank you, Regent. I think that's an extremely important observation. I, I, I think one of the things that makes it very complicated, and that's why these academic personnel plan discussions were um, undertaken and we've been very thorough, is that sometimes the uh, the deployment of, of uh, people to into the classroom who are not um, tenure track faculty is justified for a particular reason. One of the, the cases that comes to mind for me that had been consistently looked at by faculty governance was the College of Design, which often brings in then design professionals, they are to to play a role in the classroom. So they aren't on the tenure track. It's a different category of employee, but it, it obviously is um, enriches the students' experience. So we're trying to make sure through these careful discussions that as we deploy non-tenure uh, and tenure track faculty, it's for a good reason and there's a good justification. Okay. Great. And before we move to a vote, Regent Shu, please. Uh, thank you, Chair Omari. I, I don't know who best to direct this question to, but I was just wondering, so when um, when tenure is approved, I assume there is some type of salary increase um, that is associated with that. And I'm just wondering where that comes from. Will that come out of the department's uh, salary pool for the current year uh, and obviously future years? Um, the increases will, be, will keep coming out of there. but. Where do you, how do you account for that immediate change in um, salary, if there is one? 
Provost Sanson. Uh, uh, Chair Omari and Regent Chu. The university does guarantee a, a promotional increase of $3,100 when an assistant professor is promoted to associate and a $4,000 increase when uh, someone is promoted from associate professor to professor. Those are the minima. Uh, the colleges can do more. The funding for this comes from the colleges. The, uh, the, we have responsibility-centered management essentially and so the colleges are expected to pick up the salary increases. Thank you. So with that, uh, I would entertain a motion that the regular faculty candidates on the list be approved for promotion and or tenure as indicated. So moved. Second. There's been a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I'll entertain a motion that the contract faculty candidates on the list be approved for promotion to the rank as indicated. Any so motions? Moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I'll entertain a motion that the academic professional candidates on the list receive continuous appointment and promotion as indicated. So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. That is one of the most important things that we do as a region, or as regions, every year. Um, and with that, I will uh, ask the provost to introduce our faculty members who will give brief presentations for us. Thank you, Chair Omari and members of the committee, and you probably heard an exhale throughout the uh, back of the room. It is a, a great pleasure to introduce some of the faculty upon whom you're conferring indefinite tenure and promotion or promotion in rank. We've chosen um, four newly tenured faculty members to be with us here this morning. Uh, again, Rebecca's office did this, and I'm very grateful. Each of these um, faculty members has a unique academic profile, and we're doing this in part to, the chosen them in part because they're wonderful people, but also because they indicate something of the spread of work. Our first faculty member is Dahia Bar Anderson. She's from the Department of Kinesiology in the College of Education and Human Development. Dr. Bar Anderson's research focuses on sedentary behaviors and obesity prevention in children, thing we were talking about earlier in the, uh, in the meeting. Um, children and adolescents, it focuses on home and community-based interventions that incorporate both physical activity and nutrition to achieve healthy outcomes and decrease racial, ethnic health inequalities. She's been the principal investigator of grants from the General Mills Foundation, from Robert Wood Johnson the Foundation, and the National Institute of Health. Professor Gordon Birch is in the Division of Information and Decision Sciences in the Carlson School of Management. His pioneering research focuses on online crowdfunding, exploring and quantifying the influence on individual participation in online venues. His work has been published in top information systems journals and has been recognized in a number of other ways, including uh, his winning the best paper award in information systems research, the top journal in his field. Professor Michael Galope from the Department of Cultural Studies and Comparative Literature in the College of Liberal Arts has distinguished himself in the areas of music, philosophy, and the cultural history of the avant-garde. He's a highly accomplished instructor who's received rave reviews from students and colleagues alike. External reviewers offered high praise for his 2017 book, Deep Refrains, Music, Philosophy, and the Ineffable, which they describe as, a, as an impressive tour de force and as reframing music's contribution to critical discourse and humanistic inquiry. Professor Changbin Chen is in the Department of Horticultural Science in the College of Food, Agricultural, and Natural Resource Sciences. Dr. Chen's research focus is on plant meiosis and crop improvement. In addition, his, his research in molecular breeding of tomatoes has resulted in two patented tomato varieties. External reviewers characterize his work as groundbreaking and his papers as among the most cited articles in the field of plant cell biology. He's mentored visiting scholars and over 60 graduate, undergraduate, and postdoctoral and high school students, and consistently earns outstanding evaluations of his teaching. Each of these faculty members excels in research, teaching, and service. So I'd like to give you an opportunity to hear directly from them about their scholarship. Thank you, Provost Hanson. And first and foremost, congratulations are in order. Um, and are we going to go in alphabetical order? Is that right? All right, please, Professor Barr Anderson. Um, thank you, Chair Omari and members of the Boards of Regents for allowing me to speak about my passion, my research, and it's closely related to the discussion that took place earlier around health and wellness. 
The phrase, some is better than none, but more is better than some, can apply to a lot of things. Money, right? We can always have more money. A cool breeze on a sweltering summer evening. But best, it can be applied to physical activity. We are a society that has engineered all levels of physical activity, from leisure time exercise, to activities of daily living, to occupational activity out of our lives. From the use of technology, thinking about remote controls, escalators, robots that perform manual labor, to social norms in which our youth rather play video games or watch TV than go outside and play, we have become a society plagued with physical inactivity. Couple that inactivity with poor nutritional choices, and what we have is the root of the expanding obesity epidemic, which we are all far too familiar. Some is better than none, and more is better than some, is the centerpiece of my research to increase physical activity in children and adolescents, and in particular, African American girls. I'm not only interested in this population because I once was an African American girl, or the fact that my husband and I are raising two right now, but because this is a population that has the highest rates of overweight and obesity among peers, but the lowest rates of physical activity. It is well established that there is a trajectory between adolescence and adulthood. An overweight child has a 75% risk of becoming an overweight adult. And that is very evident as 80% of African American women are overweight or obese. So my research is committed to exploring how to increase physical activity and healthy eating because I am truly concerned about halting and reversing excess weight gain in African American girls. I'm particularly interested in, in examining how environmental factors such as family and home life interplay with individual and interpersonal factors to contribute to this epidemic. Some topics that I've addressed with my research are how do African American children interact with their parents, siblings, and extended family living within the home to influence choices made about physical activity and healthy eating. From a child's perspective, it could be tangible support from parents and siblings, such as parents being able to afford sports fees or transportation or attending the events, or intangible support, such as verbal promotion or discouragement to be involved. Perceptions of physical activity, food and weight, and their role in family life, such as physical activity being viewed as positive or negative, foods that are considered healthy or unhealthy within the home. Family culture and rules related to physical activity and eating. So are there rules related to watching TV for children? Is that allowed or forbidden? Is food used as a reward? And then the personal and cultural meanings concerning physical activity eating, weight, diet, and body image. In particular, the perceptions of larger body size being more acceptable in African American community and how that can affect physical activity and healthy eating choices. And hair as a barrier for regular physical activity. We don't tend to think of that, but it is a huge barrier for this population. So family is a centerpiece for many cultures and not just for African Americans. It is really my goal to better understand the role of the family when it comes to weight-related healthy behaviors and to create a culture of health in relations to physical activity for all Americans, but specifically for African American girls. We need to live in a society that presents the active or healthy way, which Vice Chancellor Olson Lloyd mentioned earlier today as the easy way for every aspect of our lives, where we live, where we work, where we learn, where we pray. And I've also started a new line of research that explores the benefits of a regular yoga practice to address cardiovascular disease risk factors such as hypertension and stress. I'm a yogi and a yoga teacher, and so I'm really excited about this work. And so hopefully in six or seven or so years, when I'm promoted to full professor, um, you'll have me back so I can talk about that work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Birch. Thank you, Chair O'Murray and members of the Board of Regents. Um, first, just let me say thank you for conferring tenure on me and my colleagues. I appreciate that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. I would have left. Um, <laughs> um, I'm kidding, obviously. Um, so the, the work that I do, it's broadly cognizant of the fact that increasingly our society and our economy is permeated by participation in online spaces. Um, if you take a look at Alexa.com, it's an Amazon-owned property these days, but what they do is they rank the most popular websites on the internet 
all 20 of them virtually depend critically on freely provided public goods by individuals, user-generated content of some form. Um, so what my work really focuses on is understanding what motivates people to contribute to those public goods. So uh, you might think that it's the same thing that, pe that drives people to contribute offline to public goods. So when I talk about public goods, by the way, I'm talking about things that are sort of, you know, they create value for everybody and the people that create them don't internalize that value themselves, right? So often you think about charitable donation offline as an example of this. Well, the thing is when you go online, the things that drive people's behaviors and contributions to these things change. And the reason for this is that we evolved offline over many thousands of years to look at cues that are sort of social cues and interactions that those things don't really exist in online spaces in the same way. So behavior can shift fundamentally. Uh, so what my work really tries to do is to understand how do social factors in these online spaces drive people's participation in those spaces and their contributions. Um, so I look at things like uh, anonymity features and peer influence and social presence in these online spaces to understand how people react to these factors and these features. And as a result, how the platform operators that maintain these spaces that host this content uh, can think about these things to design features of the platforms as well as policy in terms of how they operate them. And this becomes particularly critical. I mean, the ongoing discussion now in society around privacy with data, with Facebook being a key example of a host of one of these platforms where it's all publicly provided information by individuals, um, it's critical that we understand people's behavior in this setting um, because it's really easy to think about uh, you know, intentional manipulation to get people to share things they shouldn't share, for example, right? And this is because people aren't reacting to the cues the same way they would in the offline world, and it's easy to manipulate them, right? So my work kind of speaks to some of these aspects on how we should design these things and deal with them. Thank you. Uh, up next, oh, and I should mention that if I, you were joking about leaving, I would have actually left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Professor Chen. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Amari, thank the members of the committee. Um, so my fear is plant scientist, and uh, I, I feel like recently I gained more and more uh, respect from my family. Cause my son, look, when he watched the uh, movie about uh, the Martins, and he said, oh, you're the, you're, you will be the only one who survived in the space. <laughs> so, um, so it's, it had been a long way come to today, so it's, 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 it's a great honor today so for me. Because I grew up in the uh, deep mountain uh, in the center of China, so it's a remote area. So I started to learn English from ABC when I was a college student, so I was an adult already. So, um, but in that deep mountain, I love the plants, always the plants. And everything about plants, it's all uh, come about like food, medicine, everything comes from plants. So when I come here, and I, uh, I was here to hear uh, since the professor 2012, work around the college. There are world class plant breeders and the improvement of plant, all the uh, perspectives. In our department, we have also had, uh, um, for the junior faculty, we have a faculty advisor committee, so they basically, they just very formal advice, so step by step, everything, so for all the achievements of so today, without them, it's actually, it's, I'm not gonna be here. I will be, okay. So and then uh, my work basically uh, to improve so the two set of work, basic research, which is why we try to gain the uh, funding support from the federal funding, about understanding how you, you grow plant, you, uh, you breed for the new uh, varieties. So that way it's beneficial for the farmers, growers, and beneficial for uh, human consumers. And what's behind that? So my work basically to understand that mechanism and uh, can reduce the uh, breeding circle. So currently, as many of you know, our honey crisp breeding took 25 years. And uh, the mechanism understand it right now, so it can reduce the significant in a few years, you can get getting to the new cardiovascular varieties and for you to select. So that's basically research. And one of the examples where I 
have to show that it's, uh, it's, uh, there's uh, uh, the tomato breeding I just use as a sample so for the tomato breeding. We recently gained like a breed for very small tomatoes for the local uses because the Minnesota. When we c I come here to Minnesota, I'll have like a, a group 26 different variety of tomatoes. Only get maybe five of them can harvest the food, but most of them not. So I start to breed for tomato based on the understanding. So we get right now we released like two and the two on uh, on the a way to to be released again. So uh, those tomatoes are very small uh, tomato uh, plants, but average here, but on eight weeks you can grow and from seeds to fruits and then you get, so our seeds are not sitting there yet, but we're going to have the tomato, the first tomato will be the July sometime. So this short season tomato, high year, then good favorite tomato, and it's a year can go up to 40 tons fresh fruit in Minnesota. So that's uh, what we have. And then most recently, and uh, this research had been collaborated with uh, uh, 3M for the for NET and also NASA. NASA looked for this uh, potential at first uh, fruit vegetables for the space farming. So they're looking at good sort of short seed. So it's possible and I hope for from, from a few more few years from now and the American athletes will have their fresh sun grew in the uh, space with all f Minnesota tomatoes. So <laughs> that's uh, uh, yeah, because right now they are only have this uh, breed, trying to do the uh, leafy veg in the space. And then we're talking about like uh, uh, it's going to be the first set of tomatoes going to be trailed in NASA's facility for their future uses. So and also this is. Uh, Today it's not not the stop set or not end of the uh, for my career, so it's going to be another beginning. So in the future we continue to work on this to uh, develop the valuable crops for Minnesota uh, growers or for the world. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Professor Galapu Galope. Thank you very much, Chair Mari, Board of Regents. Uh, Provost Hansen, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a tremendous honor. Uh, my research focuses on the relationship between music and philosophy. So I'm particularly interested in how philosophers listen to and write about music. The one philosophical question about music that recurs in many contexts, and this happens in different historical locales across various cultures, in the ivory tower of academia, and also in the everyday language of musicians, is to what extent music is ineffable, that it actually, unlike language, lacks specific meaning, and some level may even resist our efforts to describe it. So for someone convinced of music's ineffability, music is very unlike language. It has the power, though, to do many things. It could convey emotional intensity. It could magically change the atmosphere of a room. It could provide a sense of sublime transcendence. But exactly how this works is especially hard, if not impossible, to describe. It turns out that many philosophers have puzzled over this question. It was pondered once by the North African philosopher, St. Augustine, one of the founding thinkers of Christianity, who associated music's lack of meaning with its proximity to the divine voice of God. It was also a topic of conversation for a collective of 11th century Islamic scholars, which would be in current day Iraq, the Ikhwan al-Safa, who riffed on a tradition in Sufi mysticism and debated the way music was capable of expressing otherwise impossibly deep romantic feelings. The several modern European philosophers had especially complex responses to the ineffability of music. This past fall, I published a book with the University of Chicago Press called Deep Refrains, Music, Philosophy, and the Ineffable. And it brought together some widely read German philosophers, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and two more modern philosophers, Ernst Bloch, Theodor Adorno, along with two French philosophers, Vladimir Jankolevich and Gilles Deleuze, all of whom puzzled over this question of music's ineffability. And the book had two aims, to investigate in historical detail how these philosophers conceptualized the powers of music, and then across the arc of the book, to put all these philosophers in a virtual conversation with one another in order to find points of agreement and disagreement. 
as it turns out, all these philosophers agreed. The ineffability of music was not something that should just inspire silence or pious devotion, as if the purity of music could never be described. Instead, they decided the peculiar powers of music were inspiring, perplexing, and actually productive for a whole set of questions that were very difficult to explain or reason out. So a couple of examples. These philosophers thought of music as providing inspiration right when language seems to fail philosophical thinking. When a philosopher finds themselves befuddled, they turn to music. For example, to try to describe the complex way we experience the inner workings of desire and passion, or the transient way in which we experience the passage of time, or political problems, imagining an ideal utopian society. Music comes and allows us to think these things. These philosophers in my book commonly asked, might the stunning power of music be heard as providing inspiration and even guidance in pondering these deep and challenging philosophical questions? In my years both in and outside of academia, I've also worked as a musician. Playing music has always inspired me, in part because it keeps me wondering if the things these philosophers say about music actually hold true in one's experience playing an instrument or performing on stage. And though I first learned to play in the world of classical music, I now play different genres, rock music, experimental music, electronic music, and I've become very interested in performing in cross-cultural collaborations. Most recently, actually for the past eight years, I worked with an immigrant musician from Sierra Leone, West Africa, named Janka Nabe. And one of the most exciting things about this and about this experience that I learned is how different this music can be from the music these philosophers wrote about. And this has kept me pushing back. In writing this book, I've often wondered what, these, what might these philosophers have said about the many kinds of music in our diverse world? Might this music help us modify, develop, critique, or respond to some of these European philosophers' thoughts? In pursuing this project, I've been extremely fortunate to work here at Minnesota. I'm in a home department called Cultural Studies and Comparative Literature, and it's an interdisciplinary humanities department, a very special place that brings together scholars from different fields. Scholars study literature, philosophy, film and television, visual culture, music and sound, as well as contemporary media. But uniting the department's mission are deep and challenging philosophical questions, questions that link the humanities to pressing concerns of politics and of society. For scholars like myself who studies music and philosophy and is preoccupied with some of these larger recurring questions about the powers of music, it's been an unquestionably ideal place to work. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you to, to the professors. It, it strikes me um, how much your work is intertwined with your personal experience and your personal interests and how those things mesh together. And it's worth noting that um, all that you do and have to do to, to get to the point in your careers where you're at now, um, but then you all have personal lives too, and I don't know how you do all of that. Uh, any comments or questions from the board? Okay. Regent Anderson? I would just say if, if these are representative of the people who we conferred uh, tenure on today, we're in good hands. <laughs> I would concur. Uh, Regent Cohen, please. Thanks, Chair Omari. I, I, wanna, I just want to emphasize the same thing. I, impressive, I think, and uh, really fascinating to hear about your work, and uh, good luck in the future. Regent Hsu? Uh, thank you, Chair Omari. Uh, professors, congratulations. And I just um, am wondering if um, if space tomatoes are ever going to be available on Earth. <laughs> it's uh, right now. It's available for many students. <laughs> <laughs> so we're we just start to because uh, the NASA tested other uh, the tomatoes right now. Uh, they, they start like uh, in the. Past a few years, only for the leaf, leaf wages. So right now, start to have. We are sending us four of those for them to test whether or not they can grow on the system in the, uh, in the lost, graded that kind of condition. So all this, it's and I actually have such image uh, pictures. Maybe uh, next time. I will have some for here. Maybe that's maybe the easier. Because all the good taste tomatoes. So if you, if you have those, you can grow in the large land and also smaller um, port. So, um, so each 
basically your land will be covered two to four inches of tomatoes. That's where the, the, the space farming looking at because they have very small, limited space. They can just use this kind of tomato uh, for the for kind of vegetables. Or we're, we're joking that the other day says if Mark has tomato and potato, he will be much more healthy because his skin will not going to be peeled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, that's what we 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 are, we are looking at. So we continue producing more and more different um, cultivars. Right now we are developing the the newer ones based on this dwarf ones, but with vitamin D. So accumulation eventually vitamin D because vitamin D is one of the, the limitations for the northern part of the. Uh, country, so we have the, the short daytime in the winter, and that's, that's also a contribute to the stress. The, if you think about stress, then the vitamin D uh, deficit is the one, one way to uh, kind of contribute to stress. So we are developing those with vitamin D rich tomatoes for Minnesota, also for, for here at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, with that, congratulations again. Thank you for being here, and we look forward to uh, continued success. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have um, two policies for review and then uh, a consent report for action. So I will turn to Provost Hansen um, for a policy review on equity, diversity, equal opportunity, and affirmative action. Thank you, Chair Omari, and uh, we have presenters uh, in, uh, in to, to bring forward these, these uh, policies. The first up is Ina Marisam, EOAA Director and Title IX Coordinator. Good morning, Chair Omari, Regents, Provost Hansen, President Kaler. Um, as Provost Hansen shared, I'm here today to present a proposed change to the board's equity, diversity, equal opportunity, and affirmative action policy. Uh, the proposed change is to add two new categories to the list of protected characteristics in the policy. The two new categories are first, familial status, and second, membership or activity in a local commission created for the purpose of dealing with discrimination. Uh, the key reason for this proposed change is to make our policy consistent with the Minnesota Human Rights Act. Uh, the Minnesota Human Rights Act prohibits employers from discriminating against an employee because of familial status and also because of membership or activity in a local commission, among other things as you can see on the screen. Um, and our policy currently doesn't include these two categories in our list of protected characteristics. Uh, this slide provides the state's definitions of familial status and local commission. Uh, in general, the familial status category protects individuals from discrimination uh, based on the fact that they have a child living with them, whether um, it's their child or a child over which they have guardianship. Uh, it also protects individuals from discrimination based on the fact that they're pregnant or in the process of securing, securing legal custody of a child. Um, the idea that the law is getting at here is that employers shouldn't presume that employees with caregiving experiences or caregiving, caregiving responsibilities for children are unable to work or to provide uh, quality work. Um, you can see the definition of local commission on the screen. Um, in general, it's defined as a city or county agency uh, created for the purpose of dealing with discrimination. Uh, so here is the proposed language for Section 2A of the board policy. Um, it adds familial status and also membership or activity in a local commission created for the purpose of dealing with discrimination as protected characteristics. Um, the policy change will make um, the board policy consistent with the Minnesota Human Rights Act um, and will also further our university's <coughs> equity and diversity goals. Um, that's the end of my slides. I'm happy to address any questions. Thank you, Director Mary Sam. Regent Shu. Uh, thank you, Chair Amari. I would, uh, just a quick question about how many people do you think this affects in our system? Uh, you know, we, in terms of getting reports about discrimination based on these characteristics, in my time at EOAA, we haven't had any reports come through. Um, I don't know that you know, adding this, how many people will come forward now that this is added to the policy. There's certainly a lot of 
you know, individuals caring for children. Um, but the idea is that, you know, if we have an employee who, you know, has twins or all of a sudden takes custody of a niece or nephew and tells their supervisor and their supervisor says, wow, you know, that, that's a big change in your life. That's going to take a lot of time. And you're working on this huge project that's really important for us. I think I'm going to transfer that project to your colleague. Um, the idea is that that, would, that kind of change would be prohibited by this policy in a situation where there was no indication that the employee couldn't do the work. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Swiggum. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Marshman. As we coordinate with the Minnesota Human Rights Act, uh, I, I don't know if there's any reason for this or not, but as I look at the uh, words that are being added to our proposed language in the policy, um, the Human Rights Act uh, ends at the word commission and not the words created for a purpose of dealing with discrimination are not in the State Human Rights Act. Yeah. Is there a reason for that? Uh, I'm just wondering, just suspect, just wondering why we would add, if it means anything at all. Yeah, so I um, I decided that when I was looking at local commission, I thought that it would be difficult for the reader to understand what exactly that means. And I think understandability of the policy is one of the key goals. Um, so what I did was I looked to the state's definition of local commission, which is up on the screen now. And the state's definition is a um, commission that's created for the purpose of dealing with discrimination. So I took that second half of the phrase from the, from the, de the definition in state law, which the hopes that it would make it more clear to our community exactly um, what we meant. So it's, Ms. Marsh, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Marsh, Ms. it's basically more descriptive. It's more uh, direct. It's, it, uh, it doesn't really add anything from the standpoint of uh, public policy one way or another. It's just more descriptive. That's right. We're not expanding the scope of the protection in state law. We're just hopefully making it more understandable to our community. Okay. Thank you. Regent Beeson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I'll vote for this, but I, the, the carving out a very, what is probably a very small subcategory under this membership or activity and local commission. I mean, there are 30 other areas that I, we could identify um, victims of discrimination for and why they've chosen um, to go to this direction, but at the exclu exclusion of others. I, it, it's just, it, it strikes me as somewhat odd and um, micro uh, in relation to the other larger categories that I see here. It, any comments? And if not, that's fine. Um, sure. Uh, thank, uh, Regent Beeson. Um, I, I agree that it does seem narrower in scope than the other categories. Um, when I look around what other institutions have done in the state, there's a couple of the smaller private institutions that haven't put this phrase directly in their policy. Instead, they've added kind of a catch-all and other legal categories prohibited by law. Um, I thought about that, um, but I, I am reluctant to put something in the policy that would require a reader to then go and find a, a law to look at. Um, but I, I understand that. It does seem different. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Marisam. Um, as this, this was approved by the Minnesota legislature. That's right. This is the language currently in the statute. Recently or in the last couple of years? I, I'm not sure exactly when it was approved. I was looking this morning, and it was in the statute at least as of 2014. So it's not very recent. And I'll, I'll just add that, you know, in my private work as an a organizational development uh, consultant, this actually comes up quite frequently um, in, in comments around um, workplace discrimination and familial status. And so I'm actually happy to see it here. Uh, anyone else? Great. So this is for review. It'll come back uh, next month. Uh, thank, thank you, Director Mary Sam. Thank you. And next we will, uh, again, this is for review, uh, Board of Regents Policy, International Education and Engagement. Provost Hanson. Uh, thank you, Chair Amari. We ask uh, Meredith McQuaid, Associate Vice President and Dean of Global Programs and Strategies Alliance to explain the policy. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Omari, members of the board, 
Provost Hansen, President Kaler. Um, this will be very brief. I want to thank you for taking the time to consider the proposed amendments to the International Education Research and Outreach Policy. Um, the amendments will not directly result in any new or different work being done, certainly by my staff and across the system, but they are important because they reflect the fact that the world and the university's place in it has changed significantly since the policy was first adopted in 1974 and then amended most recently a decade to go. Uh, the opportunity to review and reconsider the policy is certainly an opportunity for the board to explicitly identify the importance of international education, research, and outreach to the university system. Uh, attitudes about and opportunities to engage in, international, in meaningful interactions with people from around the world have certainly changed, and this revised policy reflects the university's commitment to international education, research, and outreach that are consistent with these changes. I'll just highlight a couple of the substantive, substantive amendments. One of the changes made was in an attempt to use engagement and outreach in ways that are more consistent with the way these, ter these terms are now used across the institution. Specifically, and we relied on um, Associate Vice President Andy Furco on this, outreach is seen as a corollary to teaching and learning, whereas engagement is a broader term related more to a lot of different types of interaction, and I think the amendments reflect that. The second change is the specific inclusion of research in the policy. Certainly in the last 40 years, but primarily in the last 10 to 20, much of the global activity engaged in by virtually every college on the Twin Cities campus and increasingly many on all of the other campuses are connected to research. The field of international education today is aware of the need for more than mere student mobility as well. While we used to believe that merely by moving students from one country to another, we would be internationalizing their experience. We know today that without more effort at meaningful interactions and inclusion, that we will ultimately fail to fulfill our responsibilities to educate fully. Uh, the other changes made, although there's a lot of red ink on the document, uh, are primarily uh, either and, stylistic, technical, or reflect current, current terminology in the field of international education. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions or comments from members of the board? Regent Hsu, and then Regent Powell. Uh, thank you, Chair Omari. I, uh, my question is, okay, so in terms of changing one of our policies, is it normal procedure nowadays to come to the committee first, and then will this also be discussed in uh, governance and policy, or are we bypassing governance and policy on this? Uh, Regent Hsu, the, this particular, these two particular um, uh, uh, policies are directly related to, to this uh, committee as in throughout the entire year uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say bypassing governance and policy actually the, the the process has been one by where it would come to the committee within which uh, the purview of the policy falls so will we um revisit this in governance and policy or is this the only place we're going to we'll, we'll review it today and then action will be taken in June in this committee. Okay. Yeah. Now in June there will be a conversation about the overall policy review uh, process in governance and um, uh, policy and governance in June which of course Chair Rocha will be leading that conversation. Okay, follow up. Mm -hmm. So how does this affect our normal policy review process? It doesn't. I, right. This came through the comprehensive review process before it came to us. Got it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Regent Powell. Thank you, Chair Amari. So, thank you. I, I just want to make sure that I I understand um, sort of why why we're why we're doing this. I mean, obviously, research and outreach are you know components of the mission and weren't previously in this policy. So, does this are we are we with this? Um, Amendment sort of catching up the policy to what the, you know what we're actually doing um, internationally, or does it anticipate increased activity? I mean, I just I, I don't have a problem with the policy, but I'm just I'm not I'm not entirely clear on you know why we've chosen now to to change it, <clears throat> even though it, the change makes perfect sense given the mission. 
Right. Associate Vice President McQuaid, please. Chair Omari, Regent Powell, thank you. Yes, as I understand it, uh, it's periodic review of policies. Uh, the last uh, amendments were made in 2008, and 10 years later in 2018, it's a chance to review and see whether the policy is actually current with both the, the trends in the field as well as the work we are actually doing. And in the last 10 years, and certainly since the original um, crafting of the policy in 1974, there's been a much more intentional uh, international engagement, outreach, and research. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Associate Vice President McQuaid. We will look forward to taking action on this next month. Thank you very much. Um, and now we have a consent report that is for review and action. Um, I will first uh, entertain a motion and second, and then go into um, uh, discussion. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, all those in favor? Oh, sorry. Wait. That's discussion first. Sorry. Uh, any any discussion? Regent Shu. I have a question. I, I don't have it open, so let me find it. But uh, oh, here it is. I got it. Thanks. Um, in the cases where we're discontinuing programs, um, I see that. Uh, I know there's more description uh, further down, but uh, I have a question about the School of Dentistry discontinuing the dental therapy MDT degree. And I'm just wondering, um, maybe it's below here and I read it and don't remember it, but what, what is the uh, purpose of canceling that particular program? Dental therapy MDT is... Page 174, yeah. that one. Point out the page. Okay. What was Hanson? Uh, Chair Moore, there, there's another program that's supplanting it. It's not the, okay. that we're getting rid of that, the dental therapy. All right, thank you. Any other comments, questions about the consent report? And, and I'll just make note that um, there, there's a very robust process that goes into this. We've had some presentations in previous years. I don't remember when the last time was. And I'm going to give a nod to my friend in the audience because I see you there. Um, and, and this is a, a thought out and, and very comprehensive process, but even if it's just a name change um, before it comes to us. Any other? Regent uh, McMillan, please. Thank you, Chair Omari. And uh, I also recognize the amount of work and the uh, the effort that goes into the process of anything coming to this point. But I will say, and without any criticism, I will just note that it looks as we add something here and delete something there. And if you, you pick a, let's pick civil engineering. I saw a couple things in there and I'm picking that, not because I have any specific interest in it. It will help as a board as we put a system-wide strategic plan in place to understand I think how much work goes on behind the scenes and that at some point at President Kaler's level, using my example, continuing it may be completely wrong, that we've made a conscious decision about you know where to increase capacity in civil engineering, decrease, expand, and how we get the five pieces of the system together. And they don't all do civil engineering. I recognize Duluth and the Twin Cities do, but it just feels like an opportunity to better educate us about the depth and scope and importance and you know the sophistication of that process. I know it is, but at this point it looks like, wow, 18 things got added, seven got deleted. Someone understands it all, but it, it's a little mysterious to us. You can comment. You don't have to. I'm just anxious to see that come more to life for me. Um, uh, Chair Omari and, and Regent McMillan, it's a very good point. We, all, we would like to, to re revisit that because one of the things we always want to stress is this: the, the addition of these programs does not, necess not necessarily, not typically, not usually uh, mean the addition of uh, faculty capacity. It's that people are rearranging what they do or responding to external needs for uh, uh, graduates in certain areas or people who have certificates in certain areas, but we are typically proposing these with no increase in faculty capacity. Thank you. Uh, great point, Regent McMillan. And um, my wonderful colleague to the right, uh, Ms. Flotten, just reminded me that September is typically when we do review uh, this process. Uh, so to your point, Regent McMillan. Seeing no other um, comments or questions, I will uh, entertain a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 
Um, and information items, Provost Hanson. Yes, uh, that is a regular item now on the Mission Fulfillment Committee agenda, and you will find that in your materials that really highlight uh, selected student, faculty, and staff accomplishments. So I uh, hope you review those. Thank you, Provost Hanson. And it's a great list. Just want to point out that my alma mater, the College of Education and Human Development, is ranked 19th in the graduate school rankings and number one overall in the world university. So feel free to make note of that. Uh, and offline, also, uh, if, if members would like to have conversations about the 21st Century Outreach Mission before we add that to the agenda in June, uh, we welcome that. There's been a lot of work that has been going on um, leading into to the presentation. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Mr. Chair, oh. while the people are around the table, a brief footnote that we do, in fact, do background checks on all employees that we hire. So that is a way, of course, confidential settlements or privacy laws prevent some information from being known. Thank you.